Good morning. Can you hear? Yes, you can hear me. Everybody's kind of mellow because they're a little frozen this morning. <laughs> but you're here. I am so proud of you. I mean, I, I, I should know better because you all are always here in spite of the cold and the frigid and the snow and the ice and the, <laughs> you know, trembling of the cold. But And Eden Perry, are you there also? Who's there? Somebody there? Jason? We do have a contingent at Eden Prairie, I'm sure. Uh, we're not going to see them, but they see us, is my understanding. Right, Nathan? I mean, Jason, they're not going to see us. Oh, oh, okay. Good morning, good morning. Everybody's there, too. Fantastic. You know, I have to say, I was very worried that the drive was going to be as bad this morning as it was last night, but it wasn't. Was it? I mean, at least mine wasn't from Eden Prairie. So I was very, very pleased that my last drive in on spring semester morning was not going to be as slippery, as slidey, and slow because I didn't want to keep you waiting or not be here because of the, of the, of the weather and the drive. So welcome to um, the 2015 spring semester workshop. Uh, it's great to see you. And I really appreciate you making the trek in this morning. It was, uh, I know, difficult and, and especially to get back into the swing of things after a, a nice break. I hope that your holidays were happy and restful and cheerful and that you ate a lot because that's what you do during the holidays after all, right? Um, we're going to begin the workshop uh, with what we usually do to greet our new employees. So both here and at Eden Prairie would all employees that are new to the college since September please come up so that we can introduce you. Come up here and go up to Eden Prairie to the front. Anybody new here since September? Nobody's new here since September? I, I, there are some new, you're new, aren't you? <laughs> come here, come here. <laughs> People want to meet you. People want to, to greet you. Anybody else? Where's Teresa from Customized? She's over there, I think. Anybody else, really? Oh, you're Teresa, but there's another Teresa, I think. There's another. Okay, well, let's start and tell them your name, where you work, and when you started, please. I'm Teresa Caroon. I do accounts payable, and I started in October. Welcome, Teresa. <laughs> Your name, when you started, and what you do. Okay, Desiree. Um, my name is Desiree Vang. I started um, last month, and um, I'm an enrollment service representative. Yeah. Welcome, Desiree. Anybody else here at Brooklyn Park that began since September? Okay, how about at Eden Prairie? No new folks over there? Okay, we're light on new employees, it looks like. I'm trying to see if I recognize anybody else that's new. That uh, Are you new back there? You're not new. You started in August, so you introduced yourself in, ah, great. Good. You're kind of new, but okay. All right. Well, welcome to all of our uh, new Hennepin Tech employees, uh, those of you that introduced yourself, and those of you who are too shy and are hiding under the chairs. Um, so, you know, we've had a very difficult year in many ways. Um, we have lost some of our dear, dear friends. And, um, you know, we did when we lost Lori and, and Chad in fall. And many of you heard about, um, about oh, we did that already, about Monica Lydiard passing in, um, on Wednesday. And that was another difficult, difficult um, transition for us to lose her because she um, had a long history and connection with the college. 
<clears throat> and um, she loved Hennepin Tech deeply. She began as a practical nursing student in 2006. She completed her AAS degree in nursing in December 2009. And she just wasn't ready to leave Hennepin Tech. She just loved us so much, as all of us do, that she wanted to stay. And she began working in um, 2010, right after graduation, as a temporary nursing tutor. She then worked in the TRIO program for six months prior to accepting a full-time nursing CLA position in January 2012. She coordinated and implemented the nursing lab, the open nursing lab at both campuses, and it was very encouraging, friendly, helpful, and cheerful to students, because she had been one, so she really had that connection. And I know we have quite a few faculty and staff who have been students at the college that either leave for a bit and then come back or stay on. So she ensured that both nursing labs on both campuses supported the programs, ordered supplies, kept everything ready for students. And when we had the flood of uh, 2013 over at the Eden Prairie campus, she took a leadership role in organizing the labs after the floods. I went in there and she was, because we had to take everything out in case there was mold and she was, all the supplies and she was cleaning them. I mean, I went in there and saw her working really, really hard. So, you know, we remember her, her smiling face, her cheerful interaction with all of us, her love of students, and uh, we recognized her last summer of 13 with the Spirit of the Heart Award, which is what you're seeing on, on the left-hand side of the screen. And then this is just her greeting students at graduation in May of 2013. So, you know, the, the nursing faculty and staff wanted to recognize her love of and commitment and dedication to the college and to the students. And so the nursing simulation lab has been renamed after Monica in grateful appreciation for her, un her unwavering dedication to Hennepin Technical College students. So services, you saw something come out yesterday. We'll clarify all the details, but the services will be next. Um, the wake will be in uh, visitation next Friday the 16th and the uh, funeral Saturday the 17th at Annunciation Church. And, you know, Monica continues to, to live on in the college and in her commitment and love to students. And um, she asked that... Um, that any, you know, instead of flowers, that any memorials go to the Monica Lydiard uh, Scholarship Fund that has been established at the college. The other thing that I want to say is that many of you donated leave to help Monica out during that last semester that she couldn't be here. So this leave transfer was approved, uh, and Monica's account will be credited uh, retroactively for your donation. So, uh, you know, I just want to acknowledge and thank you so much for donating some of your leave to help Monica out. <clears throat> so, anyway, it's it's really hard because we've been, when I saw Monica at the hospital in, in October, she, um, you know, still have a lot of, had a lot of energy and she asked, I was sitting, I was going to sit at the foot of her bed and she said, no, come here come here close you know she was kind of that way that she wanted to connect and feel feel that that uh, relationship with people so we could chat and 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 visit and before Anna Schmidt got there no it was Jean Bowman I'm sorry who arrived um, to keep visiting with her anyway we will keep her spirit and memory and love alive and you all do you're all reflective I think of Monica in so many in so many ways so God bless you, and, and rest in peace, dear friend. So the, the rest of the morning, oh, excuse me. There's a clicker right here. Oh, yes, 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 thank you. Thank you. So the rest of the morning, um, for at least the first part of the morning, uh, we're going to update you on a process that we have been working on now for a few years. And... Um, 
the purpose of this first session is to familiarize you with why Hennepin Tech is participating in the performance excellence assessment process to provide background information and connections and to share next steps. I've mentioned before that this assessment process parallels the National Baldridge Quality Award that organizations such as businesses, hospitals, educational institutions pursue to determine how effective they are in the pursuit of excellence and in continuous improvement. So the bottom line is that we've been participating in continuous improvement for over 17 years as a college, so it's been a gradual ongoing effort. And um, <clears throat> today we will share with you about the Performance Excellence Network process um, in, a, in a little clearer manner and um, convey that it is a state level uh, recognition process, uh, award process, and it parallels the national level, and you've heard this before, uh, Baldridge Quality Award. And again, it, it, it does um, um, kind of take us to another level in our 17-year journey of continuous quality improvement. And we will lay that, lay that out for you. So the process for actually applying, because the Penn Award at the, the local level is overseen by a state organization that serves Minnesota as well as the Dakotas. And um, so we are applying there first, and it parallels the national level uh, process. And um, we began working on it. The uh, President's Advisory Council began working on the application in July 2012. And we studied the criteria, studied the process um, at each of our meetings for about, oh, 45 minutes at the beginning of each meeting. And um, then we started actually completing the application form, and each of the PAC members took a, uh, a part of it, and we reorganized for each of the criteria. We were assisted with our coach, uh, who's here today, Nancy Hoagland. She's a senior team lead trainer and member of the assessment team for the Performance Excellence Network and oversees the entire process for Penn, the Performance Excellence Network. She also has AQIP experience and worked as our colleague in Minskew at Century College in Normandale for over a decade before moving on to her own business. So we completed the, um, the application. It's a 50-page application in November and submitted it to the Performance Excellence Network. And we're going to be um, visited in February 11 through 13 by a team of evaluators. They're volunteers for the Penn Network, and they'll come to just uh, review our application and, and, and talk with us uh, around uh, clarification. Also, I do want to say uh, several of you have seen, and we've different councils uh, from shared governance to quality and SAC have received or have been given links to the um, application process or the application application but it is available on the um, institutional research link so any of you can get onto the website and into the institutional research to review the uh, application that we submitted the 50 page application so as I said we'll be will be visited uh, February 11 through 13th by volunteer evaluators so another key benefit of having this report that points out our strengths and our areas of improvement along quality improvement and performance excellence, <clears throat> oh, this is just the linkages that I wanted to point out, that we are um, participating in the accreditation process, the AQIP, for many, many years. We're part of the National Quality Improvement Organization, SEQUIN, um, and then we're part of the Penn Network and have applied, and then that parallels uh, Malcolm Baldridge National Quality Award. So another key benefit is that we will um, receive a report after the evaluators come in February. 
And um, that report, you know, will again point out HTC's strengths and areas for improvement, and that will be a, a really good uh, resource to provide our next president. Um, and the other thing is the feedback report we'll also use as uh, a basis for our to guide our wind day planning. Wind day this year will be on, on March 6. So there's a lot of benefits that will be valuable, useful, and applicable to the future as HTC continues its journey to be a, um, continue to be a premier career technical college and continuously improve towards excellence. So, you know, um, I've mentioned that, uh, gosh, I guess it's been two and a half years that we started learning about Baldridge and the criteria and that we've, we've studied and had co uh, dialogue among our, um, our uh, PAC members, President's Advisory Committee members. So could you all, well, at least the cabinet piece of PAC come up, please, uh, the vice presidents and those that report to me, because at this point they're going to share a little bit about, just for 30 seconds, um, what benefits they saw of participating in this process and what it means to the college. Start timing me, 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> we like to travel to New York, and one of our favorite things to do is go on these big onion walking tours. And they're named that because they peel away the layers of time. And I equate that to my learning journey here at Hennepin Technical College, coming on board and really having a very steep learning curve. And this was a way for me to really understand what HTC was all about and a way to really collaborate with the fine administrative team we have at the college. Good morning, everybody. Um, for me, well, everybody knows change is the new black. And um, you've all seen the amount of change that we've had in our leadership over the last several years. And for me, the, the biggest benefit that we got as a leadership team was the, the time we spent together working on our strategic planning. And it brought us all onto the same page, and it's helping us all be aligned in what, what our mission is. Thank you. Hello. Uh, for me, I kind of came on, like, like Marilyn, like six months into the, the journey. And uh, it helped me learn a lot of what the HTC environment was all about. And I know a lot of the areas I was in, it was also good working and learning the uh, administrative team here at HTC. And in a lot of the, there's some results areas in this report uh, that I, a big thank you to both Danielle and Donna for putting a lot of these charts together. The hard part was trying to narrow it down. But uh, some of the information was like comparing us to uh, like other Minsky institutions and other, other sequin members out there too. And it's a lot of good information. I encourage everybody to go out there and, and review the report. Um, it's clear that our organization um, is on a long um, quality journey. Um, we're a learning organization. And through this process, what's um, particularly um, inspiring to me is that I developed a um, distinct appreciation for the complexities of our college. We do have a lot of um, interesting and challenging work um, and service that we provide. In order to do that, we need to be very intentional um, about the things that we do and the necessities for improvement. You know, that's the foundation that delivers um, the quality outcomes that we have. So through the um, intentionality, I think, was the biggest highlight that I found through the Baldridge um, Quality Journey Awareness. As Executive Director of Institutional Advancement and Marketing, the process of the report, again, highlighted the information that we will use for grants, um, also seeking board members. So you will see that report used numerous times. But also I'd encourage faculty to use it when you seek grants. It it's been well vetted, the information. It also appreciates the history of HTC and all that you all have put into it. And so thank you for all of you that have done great work in supporting this institution to where it is today. Thanks to each of the cabinet members for sharing their perspectives on the value of this process and what it means to the college. And I also see something that uh, I thought was very valuable. Um, throughout the process, we learn new tools to help us improve. And uh, for me, a picture has always been worth a thousand words. 
And uh, in the past, I have shared with you a, a, uh, an image that I thought was very valuable that's taken from the Baldrige criteria. And it has to do around alignment, alignment, excuse me, alignment, aligning our efforts, aligning our planning. And uh, so uh, an organization that's just starting is just reacting to problems all the time. And so the arrows are going every which way and running into each other, as this first diagram uh, shows. And this is coming right from the application booklet to guide us. And then when the organization starts improving a little bit, then there are early systematic approaches, which I think is where we were as we started this process, where you're starting to get those arrows to go in the same direction. And then the third step where you're making good progress, the uh, approaches are aligned, both the uh, strategic approaches as well as the operational goals. You have some connection between the two. And then the organization that is really in gear and uh, working very smoothly uh, is, and is uh, integrating their strategic and operational um, efforts. And that's where the blue arrow is strategic, the red is operational, et cetera, et cetera, and there's integration. So I, I learned tools such as this to help us visualize where we wanted to go as a college and improve and um, really reach that pinnacle of uh, recognition and of, most importantly, operations and strategic uh, development. So uh, one last piece that I want to show you is something taken from our last Wind Day effort, and uh, last Wind Day, which was two years ago. And um, we saw this, I think Donna really helped to put this together in the planning committee where our, um, we were making every effort and we've continued to align our priorities with this puzzle. Do you remember some of you that were holding up the placards and went up to actually integrate as best possible where we have the Minsky strategic framework and then there were priorities that emerged two years ago which they've emerged again and we'll touch on them today. Um, then Baldrige criteria is in there also in terms of helping us plan. Uh, then we have our accreditation process. It's also in quality, imp uh, continuous improvement driven, AQIP. And then our strategic, our own strategic plan, Vision 2020, that we'll be updating during Wind Day. So this is still very relevant. And again, another picture that, that um, kind of reflects the, our efforts and the direction and, and uh, what we're hoping to accomplish. <clears throat> so uh, finally, before I call up uh, the other presenters on this top topic, um, that based on the content of our application, it's being reviewed right now by the volunteer team, um, they're going to create an agenda for um, their meeting during the visit, for the time that they're here during the visit and to meet with different members. They're going to decide who from the college they want to meet with. Um, there's going to be a kickoff meeting, an opening session, and a closing session, and everyone will be invited to attend. Um, and I thank you in advance for participating uh, on the, in the site visit. Um, again, I also want to emphasize and thank uh, sincerely all of those who participated in the development of the uh, application. It was, again, it was a two and a half year process and everybody really uh, focused and put in a lot of effort and energy and I think it's very reflective uh, of our college and our sincere efforts to continuously improve. So next I'm going to call on Marguerite who is going to come up and, and give us some background on our history of continuous improvement at HTC. Um, Cecilia, before I begin, I just want to take a moment, though, first to thank you for your presentation on Monica. And I want everybody to know that Monica gave the nursing faculty and some others that worked very closely with her a true gift because before her journey um, and her path to heaven, she came onto campus, and the nursing faculty were able to, to talk to her, were able to share wonderful things about her that she was able to listen to, and she was then given a plaque, so she knew that that sim lab was being named after her. So I just want all of you to know that, and also to know that the leadership here, especially, and I, I mean this to you, C Cecilia, 
um, you were there every step of the way for the faculty and for Monica. So thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, well, my role is to talk about just our journey, our history, and I, I think I'm the perfect person to do that because Sharon talked about all the changes in leadership, and, and I'm somebody that has been here since our very first president, Sharon Grossbach, and I'll, I'll be um, going through the history. And as this slide notes up here, whether it's AQIP, which is what we use for our um, accreditation with the Higher Learning Commission, or now our application to the Performance Excellent Network, the, our focus on quality improvement is absolutely not new. It is who we are. Um, it's who you are, the work that you do every, every day to make those improvements, whether it's the frontline services or in your classroom, that you're taking the time to think about how you can improve. And I really need to put this slide up because it's important that we first step back and look at what is our mission. And I truly believe if I would ask any of you, you would know our mission is what? Technical education, right? I mean, that's, that's who we're all about. Um, and if you look, the, look at that statement, in around 2007, 8, we did change our mission statement just slightly. You know, it's still that focus on technical education. But those of you that were here at that time know that we added the word advancement. And that was strategic. Because in the years of 2003, 4, 5, those of you that are general education faculty, you know that we had an upsurge in general education. As a new faculty member coming here in 2003, nursing faculty, at that time the nursing faculty were teaching human anatomy and physiology. We were teaching a course called Phases of Adulthood, which really now is our psychology course that's taught by, Do by Tonda, or now we have three biology faculty. It was strategic for the nursing faculty to move to courses that provided transferability. And I'm using nursing as an example, but I know across the programs that that was a strategic focus to start to incorporate the general education that we were hearing our advisory committee say we needed to, um, to put the people out there to work, whether it was hands-on programs or techni you know, technical education, or we also knew that many of our students wanted to continue their education. So we started the word advancement was those pathways. I'm looking at Ernie and Bob here, and I think about the manufacturing you know, students in fluid power and our relationship with um, Moorhead, operations management, that allows students to continue their education. So it was truly strategic to add that word advancement, but at our core, we are all about technical education. If you look at our vision, and, and our vision is quality. Once again, that quality is not a new, a, new, a new piece of who we are. And then if you look at our values, you see that we're always looking for continuous improvement. I think about some of our processes in financial aid that we've improved upon, you know, looking at process documentation. How can we do things better? On February 24th, leaders from faculty, administration, people that are on the um, ASC team, our curriculum committee, we're going to look at our curriculum processes. Are they working? Yes, but could they be better? And Marilyn is bringing a facilitator in to do the Kaizen, how do I say it? Kaizen, sorry, Kaizen process to help guide us. So we do value that continuous improvement. Boy, how many of you remember Sharon? Quite a few, right? Um, our history is, goes way back to 1972. We were first a, a, a um, suburban technical What's the exact name? Suburban so Hennepin County Area Vocational Technical Center. That was the first name. And the name changed a number of times before the merger in 1992. And when I refer to the merger, that's when we became part of the Minnesota State College University system. And Sharon Grossbach was our first president, hired in 1995. And she brought with her, or set a foundation for what she called new designs. And those of you that raised your hand, I'm sure remember what New Designs is, but really New Designs is a philosophy. It's a philosophy that I'm going to show has carried through right to this day. The philosophy was that we are focused on student success, and the other piece of her philosophy was that we recognized employees as leaders, empowered, empowered people to be part of our decision-making processes. When I came here in 2003 as a nursing faculty member, I left MCTC, and I must admit I was nervous to come here because I really liked it at MCTC, but I knew when I got here there was a different feel. And some of the things that were different 
is as a faculty member at MCTC, my dean, who I greatly respected, Jane Foote or Joanne Wandre, way back, handed me my schedule, and this is what I was doing. <laughs> I came here, and we got together as a group of faculty. We worked on the schedules. We were the ones that you know, had been working with the students. We put together the, st the schedules. It wasn't very often that I recall at that time my dean, Glenda, changing that, but we had that opportunity to work together on that. And then when I found out that I got to be able to be part of equipment request, that was so different than what I had experienced at MCTC. And that we got to put in information about facilities, things that needed to be improved. We got input into the budget. Not that we always got exactly what we wanted, but we had input. So I just share that as uh, her, Sharon's foundation of engaging employees. I truly felt that as an employee coming from a different institution. <clears throat> It was in 2003 that we decided to use AQIP as our process for um, maintaining our accreditation with the Higher Learning Commission. And the leadership at that time and the faculty and staff could really see that AQIP aligned to the, um, com and complemented the principles of new designs. AQIP really um, encouraged the emphasis of engagement, encourages all, everybody to be part of that process. So for Sharon at that time as our leader, that was, a, I think, probably an easy decision for her to choose AQIP um, as the means for accreditation. Sharon is also credited for our work, or our, um, share, uh, excuse me, Cecilia mentioned, our connection with Conti Continuous Quality Improvement Network. That was in 2000. So we've gone to 14 institutes, summer institutes, since that time. There, um, the, the institute is not only made of colleges, it's made of industry, and there are 48 colleges involved nationally, but in Minnesota there is only three, and we're one of three. Rogers, Rochester Technical College and St. Cloud is, are the other two colleges. Continuing our line and utilizing kind of the president as that common theme, I'm sure many of you remember Ron Kraft. Ron served as our vice president of student affairs for many years, and Ron then was interim president and he was here during the time that we developed or were working on our first portfolio. And at that time, there was over 100 people engaged in the activities of developing that portfolio. Um, we had a consultant at that time, John Zizinski, that helped guide that, just like we've you know, hired um, Nancy to guide us through the Baldridge piece. Um, certainly, Ron understood the new designs philosophy. He understood the focus on student success. Our next president was Catherine Jeffries, and, and Catherine also supported our quality initiatives. Catherine's tenure year was short, but in, during that time, I think the gift that we gave to Catherine is that she was part of the um, sequin process, you know, co conference, and she took that with her to Sacramento College when she took on a new role as president out in California. Marty, wow, now. Marty, I don't know if all, everybody knows this. How many know, remember Marty? Marty was here, and he would often say he was here when? When they did what? The first shovel into the ground, right? Because he, 1972, he was a math instructor, and then became a dean, senior dean. He um, ended up, yeah, at the very end, being our interim um, president before uh, Cecilia was hired. And he really, truly provided for us continuity and alignment during that period. Um, he embraced absolutely at what was at our core. Cecilia. Cecilia was hired in 2008. And when Cecilia came, it was clear, I think, to all of us that her focus was students. Um, she bubbled it. I, I used that word with Nancy the other day. And she said, that just really describes who Cecilia is. She's focused on students. She's focused on student success. She's focused on opening different opportunities for students. And if you think back to Sharon Grossbach and new designs, it aligns exactly to new designs. Once again, you know, focusing on learning environments that su support student success. And when I think about what has happened during Cecilia's time here at the college, there is so much to celebrate. She's increased access for students. It, she's asked us to think differently to work with, I'm thinking about empowered. For myself, working with Fast Track, providing students another entry into our campus. Often, there are students out there that do not see the front door as a possibility for them. And the Fast Track grant, empowered, our work with adult basic education 
has provided an opportunity for people to come in, as Joe Fred Cove would say, through that side door and come and be successful. I know as a former faculty member here, and I know for all of you, you know that many of our students have had negative experiences, whether in high school or at another institute, whether it's a four-year institute or a two-year. But they come here, and they can do hands-on training, and the connections start to happen. On a personal note, I can share that my oldest went off to a four-year college. Struggled. Struggled with some of those general education courses that he was having a hard time with. And when I, I'm going to use math as the example. He got into the fluid power program, started with the hands-on, and then understood why I need to understand math. So then when he went to the math class, he could make those connections. And I'm happy to say he's a graduate of that program and employed and doing well. So we, we provide opportunities for students who I can tell you from a personal note felt very, very down that he wasn't successful, what didn't make it in that four-year path. But that's not for everybody. We are unique, and we have so much to be proud of. In terms of access also, um, the re outreach that we have had to um, high schools and to specific populations, we've seen a real, cl uh, not a real, um, a closing of our achievement gap. In fact, it's the smallest in the state, and that is something to be extremely proud of. We have the lowest achievement gap between white and non-white students. I think. <laughs> My mouth is getting so dry, sorry. <laughs> the other um, thing that I think about as a leader here, something that we didn't have before was all the grants. Boy, take a guess how many millions of dollars of grants since Cecilia has started here. Anybody? You can tell I'm a teacher at heart. I'm trying to engage you into the conversation. Over $5 million of grants. And that's those $5 million. When I talk about $5 million, I see Sherry out there saying it's more than that. I, should, I need to clarify that. $5 million of grants, $5 million towards student success, the SSI um, types of grants. And then that's a federally funded grant, but then we have the private of the Gateway to College. So a lot of great work. That sound about right, Cecilia? About five million? Over five million? Okay. It's more than that, Craig. How many dollars? Right. I was. I used um, Dare. I talked to Dare, and we were focusing. Just so everybody knows, I was focusing on the student success, the SSI grants. But you're right, Craig. We've we've received a, a lot, a lot more grants. But these grants have been focused on helping students to be successful. Um, so certainly, um, kudos to all of you for the work. Just try. <laughs> As my faculty team would say, don't let her get up in front of people because she likes to talk. <laughs> Anyways, um, the, and there they are. <laughs> um, the other thing that happened during Cecilia's tenure here too is our first AQIP portfolio, when we got back our feedback, one of our big, big opportunities was, boy, you have a lot of data. But what are you doing with that data? How are you using it to make decisions? And um, Cecilia then hired an institutional researcher, Donna Statzel, who has helped us to make data meaningful, helped us to guide how do we make our decisions, helped us to step back. I know for myself, I have to remind myself, maybe not to make that decision just on a gut decision, but to step back and say, gather some information, look at it, and make a data-driven decision. So thank you for that. The other focus that um, aligns with new designs from with our current president back historically is that recognizing employees as leaders entrusted to carry out the mission and goals of the college. That's that new de design philosophy. And we certainly have um, seen that in Cecilia's leadership, establishing the staff advisory council, the quality council, hiring practices. Many of you that have been on hiring committees know that we try to incorporate a question to our candidates on quality improvement. How do they improve, you know, improve their own work practices? Have they been part of a team that has worked towards quality improvement? So it's that important that as we look to bring new people aboard, we're asking that as part of the interview question. She's implemented some of the sequin um, practices. All of us know the friendly, professional, helpful service. When I think about professional, I know we spent a lot of time on 
you know, what does professional mean in terms of voicemail and email and that we try to get back to people within 24 hours? And even if we don't have the answer, but at least to give them a response so they know that, um, that you're going to get back to them. Um, she was here during the submission of our 2009 and 2014 portfolios. And I must say, um, giving, I want to give some kudos here to Donna and Marilyn and the whole team that worked on. How many of you worked on our last AQIP portfolio? Boy, having been here for the first one, what a difference. What a huge difference to have an institutional researcher. And I, I mentioned Donna, but I also, where's Danielle? Um, you know, Danielle, your, your work, um, I know Craig spoke to it earlier, but to put those, those documents together, because part of that portfolio, whether it's for Baldridge or AQIP, we can talk about all the great things we do because we know how wonderful we are, right? We can talk about our processes, but what the evaluators want to see is the measurements. And that is the gift of having a, an IR office and being able to make that data meaningful and to, to recognize us for the work that we, that we do. <clears throat> At one of our, our meetings, somebody had said that feedback was a gift. And I know, Cecilia, if, if you have been in meetings with Cecilia, she has a book you know, that she writes down things when something she hears that she likes. And I remember her writing that down. Feedback is a gift. You know, and whether it's from AQIP or Baldridge, it helps us to celebrate upon our strengths. It also allows us opportunities for improvement. It validates who we are. And as I look out and I see people from different programs, many of you have outside entities that give you feedback, whether it's in the business area or in the manufacturing area or in the health with all the accrediting bodies that we have. We're always looking for feedback. Is it always what we want to hear? No, but it gives us that opportunity to make the changes and improvements that may be needed. And the so what of feedback is how do we use it? If we get it and we don't use it, then we're, we're not improving. <clears throat> Caring forward. We're in the middle of now starting a search for a new president. And when he or she gets here, this, these feedback reports are going to be extremely valuable. And maybe I should step back before the feedback report, even for that person to read our AQIP portfolio, to read our application for the um, Performance Excellence Network. It really is going to talk about the core of who we are. We are high-tech career preparation. We're real-life skill development linked to employment. We're, we have state-of-art equipment here. We're the we have the largest array of cutting-edge technical programs in Minnesota. And we're the biggest standalone technical college in the state. And we have non-traditional access and pathways. He or she is absolutely going to see that in both of those documents. He or she is going to experience the quality improvement culture as our previous presidents did. As you, I would assume, as I share my story as a new faculty member, you feel it. You feel it's a different culture. It is all about wanting to improve. It truly is the fabric of who we are. I wanted to share just a little bit about feedback. I know Nancy's going to talk a little, you know, much more about um, AQIP and, and our uh, Baldridge application. But it did, when I think back to 2009 or our second um, report, it does give you that opportunity to celebrate your strengths. And what I want to share is one of the strengths was our, what, back, back in 2009 when we submitted our, our first portfolio, um, Oh, that wasn't our first portfolio, excuse me. 2006 was our first portfolio. Um, when we submitted that, one of the things that they identified as a strength was the program review process. And even though it was a strength, we continued to work on making it better. In 2008, we decided to align it to AQIP. So when we sent the letters to the faculty and to the advisory team, many of you will remember it started to say, these are your strengths, these are your opportunities. And on some rare occasions, there were some concerns. We tried to, to align that. The program review process used to be an annual every year was done. We realized that that's not giving program faculty enough time to respond to the goals that they were setting. So it was changed to what? A three-year cycle. And then last year, well, before last year, the other thing I should say is at a strategy forum, we focused on the program review process. Sue Sellen, Donna, Dan, I'm trying to think of who, um, I know Lisa was there, myself, there was another, uh, Jason Cope, um, really looked at that program review process and how can we still, 
we called it program advancement at that time, but how can we make it better? I share this as an example that we're continuing to strive to make it better. Now we have a shared drive for the program advancement. The other wonderful thing we did last year is instead of the dean going to the senior leadership to present the programs, the work is who? Who did all the work of preparing that document? I must not be very engaging because you're not answering. Faculty. <laughs> Faculty did the work. So instead of the dean just presenting, it's the faculty that are there presenting that report to the senior leadership. And it went really well. And I look forward to this year being there with, for my area, the medical assistant faculty and health unit coordinator faculty member to be there to present that, their reports. So we continue to improve upon that. Partnerships. Partnership was another thing that was identified as something very strong for us. And of course it would be. We need partners. I think about our advisory boards. Our programs rely on those advisory boards to, boards to provide them feedback on how they sh can do things better. What's, what's changing in industry? Our partners with Annette and our foundation and the team that she works with to ensure that we have people that are out there that are donating equipment, donating dollars for student, student uh, scholarship. These industry partners also provide clinicals or externships. For many of our programs, we couldn't, our students couldn't graduate without those partnerships. But even though that's a strength, we continue to work on that. Opportunity for improvement, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but as, as I said, data was um, something that was identified and we continue um, to work better. I know for myself, I have to remind myself to step back and remember I can go to Donna's website, I can pull up data. Sometimes I call her and she says, well, Margaret, it's right on the website. So she's gonna spend some time reminding all of the, uh, us of that, so. Um, I put this AQIP spelt with a U in it, and sometimes people misspell it. But I was looking at that, and I thought, you know, when they put that U in there, it's all about you. It's all about all of you that that, that book represents. It represents the work that you do. Lastly, these um, slides are actually right from, give credit to the Higher Learning Commission, these are themes that the Higher Learning Commission or AQIP would see as quality improvement themes. And we absolutely align to this. We are engaged in planning. We're gonna be having our next wind day this, this semester, looking for input from our, our faculty and staff. Um, we're driven by our mission. I think each and every one of you understands our mission is technical education. We understand change, you know, we've had quite a bit of change over the years, but yet we, we um, remain constant with our, with our mission. We're building and we're learning focused, we're building on assessment. I, I could have mentioned assessment as an opportunity for improvement in our AQIP portfolio and the work of our assessment committee under the leadership of Mike McGee, Sue Sellen. We've been working on our learning outcomes across the college and expanding that now in the future into writing. Um, so we continue to grow. We are a connected institution. We each have, I, I think the thing when I talk to people across the college is that there's such a passion for students. Whether you're frontline services or faculty or uh, administration, we're all here because of the students. And I think when I, a common theme that I hear when I talk to people is that we change lives. You know, we give education that can be short-term whether it's a certificate or a diploma, but we put people out to work and we absolutely change their lives. And at the foundation event, when those students speak, if you haven't been to a foundation event and heard, heard the student speakers, that is the most powerful statement and testament of the work that you do each day. So thank you for that. We are a collaborative organization. We collaborate with our external partners, but we also collaborate internally. We look to each other to share best practices. I think in closing, I'm hoping that this presentation showed you the history of our quality improvement journey that since our first president to our current president, we are focused on student success and employee engagement and that we value quality improvement. Thanks. Oh, oh I forgot one slide. One more slide. This is just our next steps, and just really what I want to align here is that when we get these feedback reports, it absolutely needs to be used for planning. 
So you see the arrow going down there. I really wanted the arrow. I'm sure graphics, somebody could help me to show me how to get that arrow to bend. But um, it's, it's going down that path <laughs> to, for planning. So we will be using our, our new president, certainly will be using those feedback reports and working with all of us as we plan for the future. So thank you. I just wanted an applause twice. I'm sorry. Um, I have the great privilege of uh, introducing Nancy, Nancy Hoagland, who it's been a joy to work with, and she's going to talk more about the details of our alignment with AQIP and our application for Baldridge. Thank you. Thank you. Well, hello and good morning, everybody. I just, um, for those of you don't, who don't know me, I'm Nancy Hoagland, and um, I know many of you here. Um, I previously worked with Minsky in the system office and at Normandale and Century, and I've been around. And for me personally, this is really quite the honor to be able to work with Hennepin Tech. Um, I way back went in the system office, and I think about those slides with Sharon coming up there, and it just brought back memories when, um, when AQIP first came about, and there was only a handful of institutions even exploring this thing called continuous improvement accreditation and Sharon was one of the leaders and we put together we um, were part of the founding members of the MinQIP group and at that time it was just people in MinSKU and actually we had other institutions as well just saying well what is this and how could we apply these type of principles to our accreditation process and so Hennepin Tech has always been in the forefront and I say this from somebody who worked with all of the institutions and still work with a lot of you know, institutions in higher ed, not only in Minnesota, but in other states as well. And so I, um, coming from Minskew and then now being outside of Minskew, I have a much broader perspective and even a deeper appreciation for what's going on here. And um, a couple of things I had to mention is I did go to the foundation dinner recently and really thought that was one of the better um, just events that I've been to in the system because of when the students did get up there and speak and that was really moving. The other thing that was really cool that I attended here in this room is when you guys put on the um, the movies that you did um, with the students on the Civil War and I have talked to many people outside of here about the work you're doing and just also didn't realize some of the things you're doing because I've been on campuses where we weren't doing that type of thing. So I also appreciated some of Marguerite's remarks because I too have been on many campuses and worked places and there is something different here. So for me personally, I just really appreciate all of the um, uh, relationships. And then when I look at PAC, I really want to acknowledge them as well because um, it's not like there wasn't already a lot of stuff to do here or, you know, it's not like you were looking for things to do. And we interjected this whole idea of, well, what if we looked at Baldridge? You know, you're already doing AQIP. This is really the next logical step. And in the beginning, I think it was like, well, you know, okay, let's take it. There's a little bit of caution, you know. And now I'm looking at this leadership team, and they are having very different conversations. Wouldn't you agree? Every time we meet with PAC, they are, they are leading differently. They are talking differently with each other. They are using this criteria in ways that, um, as a, a Baldridge um, practitioner, it's very um, exciting for me to see this going on here. So um, I just had to lead with that. So for those of you who haven't seen this, this is the cover of your first Baldridge application. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, how we approached this. And so while many of you across campus were busy working on the AQIP portfolio, the administrators were working in a parallel process and they were writing the Baldridge application. So some of the content that was um, being developed for Baldridge was also used for AQIP. And in turn, some of the work that you were doing in your committees, um, your uh, category teams for AQIP, we pulled some of that information and included into Baldridge as well. And that was really by design, as we want to make sure that these two um, criteria are intersecting. 
So a little bit of background. Back in 1987, Congress established um, and, and enacted into law what is called the Malcolm Baldrige Quality Improvement Act. And so up here is just a little bit um, from what was actually enacted into that law. Back in 1987, as you may recall, we were losing a little bit of the global market share, um, especially manufacturing. And so uh, Congress was very concerned at that time, and they said that we um, were being challenged by foreign competition. We had less productivity growth than our competitors uh, globally for over two decades. They saw some things that were um, happening in Japan, and they said we, we need to um, um, do something as this is a nation. Uh, so there, it was deemed that we needed to have this commitment to excellence to preserve the well-being of our U.S. economy and to be able to compete um, globally. And it was believed that quality improvement and that whole concept of improving was applicable to everybody, business, whether it was large or small, um, all level of industry and the public sector. It was also believed that quality improvement must be management-led and that it must be customer-focused, and again, across all sectors. So they wrote that right into the law. Um, they also wrote that creating a national quality award program in the U.S. would help us to improve our quality and productivity and to become more competitive. So one of the things that um, you're going to hear is a lot of different terminology around the criteria. With AQIP, it's pretty easy. Uh, we all know it's part of the Higher Learning Commission, um, although before that it used to be NCA, so you know we've had to make some transitions along the way there too with the lingo. But with Baldridge, it's basically a set of criteria. So because Malcolm Baldridge at the time in 1987, he was the U.S. Secretary of Commerce, and he was really the guy who um, was meeting with the President at the time and um, Congress and really getting that sense of urgency around this. So he um, was the person who really got all of this together, got this legislation going, and so they named this in his honor. Now, in addition to being the Secretary of Commerce, he was also a rodeo cowboy. So um, very interesting um, dual career there. And unfortunately, he um, got killed in a rodeo accident. So that's why he never actually got to see all of this come to fruition. So when you hear Baldridge, it's basically just being named after Malcolm Baldridge. Um, but it's also the name that is um, applied to the criteria itself, which is called the Baldridge Criteria for Performance Excellence. And it's also the term that we use um, to talk about the national program and the national quality award. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how um, it applies here in Minnesota. So it's basically the same set of criteria. It's internationally used. Um, and then across the states, we also have state programs that basically teach people the Baldrige criteria and also provide assessments against that criteria. In Minnesota, we have an organization called the Performance Excellence Network. And they are the professional association that uh, provides the assessments. They are our Baldridge link to the national program. Then we also, so we have Baldridge, we have Penn, and then we also have the Performance Excellence Award. So that is specifically just for uh, Minnesota and the Dakotas. So if you're in South Dakota, you're going to get the South Dakota Performance Excellence Award. If you're in North Dakota, which we're hoping to get some recipients for that, um, then they will get North Dakota Performance Excellence Award. So just different terminology, but we are a regional program. So far we've had the majority of applicants from Minnesota, and then a couple of years ago we invited the Dakotas to join us, and we have now had two applicants come through from South Dakota. And we're hoping to get Iowa involved as well.
So again, just a little bit more about what, what is going on at the national level as the result of this law that was enacted. So we have the National Baldrige Quality Award Program, and it's the nation's public-private partnership. Its mission is to improve competitiveness and the performance of U.S. organizations for the benefit of all U.S. residents. How do they do this? It's by establishing criteria for evaluating improvement efforts, um, by recognizing national role models, and it's the only um, award for performance excellence at the national level, and it is the only award that's personally given out by the President of the United States. So every year um, there's a couple of award winners that come out. It's a very competitive process. It's not one of those awards where it's just every year we have one for like let's say business, education, healthcare type thing. You really have to be operating um, at that level to achieve this level of recognition. So if we actually had a year go by where nobody met that, then there would be no award. Uh, one of the things that they do um, is required by the program is once you receive that um, national level of recognition, you are uh, required to share your best practices because, again, the idea behind this is about being world class. If your organization is world class, that helps the United States be world class and that helps us to keep increasing ourselves in that global marketplace. So one of the ways that best practices are shared is something that you've been involved with for a long time. And as Marguerite said, you've gone to Sequin 14 different times to that summer institute. Many of those presentations that you're hearing are from Baldridge winners as they fulfill this obligation to share those best practices. And then you've in turn incorporated some of those back into Hennepin Tech. So again, this is something that you've already been doing. You just you know, might not have looked at it in this way. So, um, so what we did with the application process is really just to formalize it. So the first set of criteria was established in 1987, and primarily at that time it was being heavily used by manufacturing, and of course you have a very um, strong connection to that sector as well. Um, and then in 1999, um, additional criteria was included and expanded so that education, both higher ed and K-12, would be included as well as health care. And then um, I just make a note here that AQIP was also established in 1999 and that some of the Baldrige criteria was included early on um, in that process. And then in 2005, the criteria was expanded for uh, nonprofit and government as well. There's been about 97 winners nationally since the program began. We've had nine in Minnesota. We're very active in this program. Um, and the most recent is Cargill, um, Cargill Kitchen Solutions. So um, they are the part of Cargill that just about anywhere we go and we get egg product, um, that's, that's their division. And so they won in both 2006 and 2012. And we're still waiting for somebody from education to get at that level. So keep on this. So some benefits, um, as Cecilia and Marguerite alluded to, is that it's really all about identifying your strengths and then those next opportunities for improvement. Um, with Baldridge, what we're basing that on is a proven validated set of criteria so that it's not just um, necessarily just a collective thought of what we think we need to improve. It's also really looking at that criteria to make sure that if we really want to advance in levels of maturity, which we're going to talk about shortly, that, that you really need to look at where you're focusing those um, strengths and opportunities specifically. Another benefit of Baldridge is that it facilitates and guides your improvement through those maturity levels. It promotes organizational alignment and integration. It assists in the delivery of value to all of your students and your stakeholders. It facilitates personal and organizational learning. And um, I appreciate the cabinet sharing uh, some of their personal learning as well this morning. And that it also uh, helps you to monitor progress over time. And just to build off what Marguerite said, um, it definitely is all about those measurements that, that drives us to those higher levels of performance. 
So this is the criteria book that Cecilia had mentioned. This is the Baldrige Criteria for Performance Excellence. It's one set of criteria. However, we package it into three different versions. Um, there's a slight difference in language. So uh, the book on the left, which is the blue cover, that is the criteria that's used for business, nonprofit, and government. And so the language in there is heavily focused on how you're serving your customers. Uh, the book in the middle with the red cover, that is the education criteria, and that is what is used for both um, K-12 and higher education. And then on the right with the purple cover, we have the health care criteria. And so you might wonder, people say, well, how did this criteria come about? Like, where did it even come from? So back in 90, um, 1987, what they did um, with Congress was they pulled together experts from higher ed, business, um, all different sectors, and they brought together this pool of experts and they tasked them with going out and identifying the highest performing organizations. And at a time when we were losing market share, they said, but there's some organizations out there across sectors that this doesn't seem to be affecting. And we want to know why. We want to know what's making them so good. Why are they so successful when other people aren't? So this team went out there and they asked all of those questions. And these organizations were more than happy to share you know, what was making them be so successful. And they found that there was a lot of common um, themes and trends. So that's basically how the criteria was developed. And then every two years, because we have all of these new Baldridge winners, the bar is continually being raised on what it means to be at world-class performance. So, um, so we actually have a process at the national level where every two years uh, we produce a new set of criteria. So it's very important to continue using the criteria. Um, you know, sometimes we have people come through the program and they, they continue at the same level of performance. And two years from now, you know, the bar is going to be raised. So if you were considered, um, when Cecilia showed the arrows, you might have been very aligned at one point, but maybe now it's taken a step back. So it is a process, and um, it's a very valuable one to be on. So I want to show you what the categories are. These are the seven categories of the Baldridge criteria. We lovingly call this the hamburger chart. Um, so hopefully you can see that connection. And um, so the top bun, as you would um, see here, is called the organizational profile. And what that is, it's a five-page document that's been posted on your website. Anybody here happen to have looked at that document? Has anybody seen that? Perhaps. I see Danielle has, yes. Randy, Mike, excellent. So what that is, this is a really great document because whether you're doing Baldridge or not, you want to have an organizational profile it, because it's a really good communication tool. It helps everybody in the organization and outside your organization understand what is most important to the organization. And so... Um, so I guess that's your homework then. This is a learning institution. So everybody gets going, at least look at that five-page document um, and have some conversation on it with your colleagues because this is really about all of you. Um, this isn't just a document that's being done as part of this process. This is a document for you to be using and to really be having dialogue about. So I'm going to leave it there because you're going to be looking at that. Um, the other part of the criteria is we have the seven categories. Categories one through six we call the process categories. And what this is is these are just simply um, the processes that you use um, to do the work that you're doing here. And then category seven is about the results. So the idea here is, there, is that there's a cause and effect relationship. So whatever you're doing over in categories one through six, the hope, you know, the intended outcome would be is that you're, you're going to have some sort of results to report around that in Category 7. And so we're looking at three basic questions with Baldridge. Are you any good? Are you getting better? And how do you know? That's where Category 7 really comes in, is, is answering that question of how do you know? If we say that we're world class or we're cutting edge or um, all of those types of things, in Baldridge we say... In order for you 
to use that language, we really need to take a look at the data on your performance in Category 7. And we want to see how consistent is it over time? How is it trending? And who are you comparing yourselves to? So when I do Baldridge training, I'll say, are you, um, how do you know if you're any good? I mean, are you comparing yourself to the cream of the crop or the cream of the crap? You know, it's just, um, you know, so that's why we, we use the word relevant, is to make sure that you're looking at those industry leaders, and those can be from within or outside of your um, sector or your organization. So, um, for example, in Minsku, you do a lot of comparing um, with the other institutions. Um, however, you can also use best practices from other organizations. Um, because, again, this is all about the processes and how you do things. So, for example, um, L.L. Bean has been a, um, somebody, or Amazon has been used as best practice for customer service um, types of processes. Uh, Ritz-Carlton um, has been used by many different organizations as a best practice. And I will say, too, um, not specifically to Baldridge, but when I was back in the system office, um, is, Car is Carol Larson still here? She used to be like in the... Uh, no? Okay. Well, we used to use her a lot for best practice, and other people here in this room, you know, and Sharon, um, and pe people I've known for a long time. When I was at the system office, and we were looking at doing something systematically, and we wanted to improve somewhere, we knew there was some need, we would say, let's call Hennepin Tech. And I would call Hennepin Tech, and I would say, we need a best practice. We need something that we can share, you know, who can help us with this. So that's why I'm saying this is just really cool to be here, because I just feel like this journey has been going on for a very long time. So the other thing that you'll note here um, is, well, first, let me just walk through the actual category. So we have results. And then category one is leadership. So that's where there's going to be questions about you know, how do senior leaders lead? How do they set the vision and values? Um, how does that get communicated throughout the entire organization? What are the legal and ethical practices here? And how are those being carried out? Um, category two is all about strategic planning. And so there's two parts to that. The first part is really how do you uh, establish your plan? And the second part is how do you implement it? And um, the implementation part for any organization is usually much more difficult than the planning part. So that's why there's very specific criteria to help you um, get to that full implementation. Category three is the customer focus. So in higher ed, we're looking at um, how are we listening to and engaging our students and our other stakeholders. And then uh, category five, is our workforce focus. So one of the things that we look at there in the criteria is, do we have employees, including ourselves, um, that are empowered, um, motivated, and competent? And so, for example, in training, I will ask um, leaders, when you think about your workforce, you know, what happens when you have employees who are like highly competent, but they're not real motivated to do the job? How does that impact your results in Category 7? Or let's say you have somebody who's highly um, motivated and they're highly competent, however, they're not necessarily empowered to do their job or to necessarily follow through on that. Not that any of us have ever had that experience. However, this does happen. So, um, so that's why Category 5 really gets into some specific questions. And one of the things I heard today that was a best practice just in the presentation was how in your hiring processes, which is part of the criteria, is how you actually incorporate quality questions into the interview process. So that's a very good best practice. Category 6 is all about the operations focus. So this is really looking at what are your key processes for the organization. Um, what are the processes that you do internally here? What are those core competencies that you have that you're delivering on? And then who is it that you're partnering with for other types of services? And then underneath there, you're going to see Category 4. So you'll see that the bar stretches across all of them because we really need to have reliable data to support everything that we're doing at the institution. 
So that's what so that's what you're going to find in Category 4. It's all about information technology, how you're transferring knowledge across the institution, um, and what type of data you're using for these other categories. And then underneath that, you're going to see I included the AQIP, the six categories, and there's a lot of similarities. There's a little bit different focus in AQIP because um, that is about continuous improvement accreditation. So you have categories and then you have these subcomponents that are very specific to higher education institutions. Um, but one of the things you'll notice is in Baldridge, we have categories one and two. We have leading and strategic planning. And then when you look at category four in AQIP, um, that, that's the same thing. It's incorporating a lot of that same criteria uh, with planning and leading. And this is the new AQIP criteria that's just come out recently. So it may look a little bit different than um, what you've all seen. And the other distinction I'd like to make is that in Baldridge, we actually have a specific category for results in seven. So for example, when we're looking at leadership and we're looking at all the different things that leaders are doing, when we get to category seven, we are looking for specific results that are associated with that activity. When we're looking at your workforce um, approaches in category five, when we come over to category seven, we want to see that cause and effect relationship. So we're looking for results. Um, in AQIP, some of the results are actually more embedded within the other categories. So that's why you'll see six categories versus seven. Um, and then in Baldridge, we actually have an entire way that we score um, every category and the items within it has a point value. Because again, the goal is to really drive high levels of performance. And so you would really need to have some sort of a, um, a point system to be able to drive that. few other comparisons just for language. In Baldridge, we have an organizational profile. In AQIP, you have an institutional profile. Um, in uh, Baldridge, we have the application. AQIP, we have a portfolio. And so I just wanted to include some examples to show that um, it's very much a parallel process. We just um, have different terminology. This is... Um, what you're going to see on the top is from the new AQIP guidelines. And then on the bottom, you're going to see what's pulled out of the Baldridge criteria book. And what this is, is it shows those actual stages of maturity. So again, it goes back to the arrows that Cecilia uh, referenced earlier. However, you're going to see that um, there's another variation of that. So when you look at that one picture with the guy with the fire hose, um, I don't know about you, but I have had times when I feel like I'm that guy, you know. And so this is where you really self-assess and you say, okay, you know, you know, am I putting out fires? Or I look over at that next picture, you know, am I being a little more strategic, a little more systematic? And then, and then you just start to look at where where you in your area and the organization as a whole is moving in terms of alignment. So. Um, when you look at the Baldridge and we have the point value, the new AQIP guidelines actually took the same thing out of the Baldridge criteria, and now they're asking you to evaluate this as an institution as you go through the categories. So I just wanted to show a comparison here that you have the AQIP uh, maturity levels, and they're asking you to self-evaluate that, where in Baldridge we're going to have the evaluation team do that. Another um, similarity is, okay, in Baldridge, here's the high-level view. We submitted the application in November. There will be a site visit in February. The report will come back in March. Then we'll have an improvement planning session, which is about a two-hour overview of the report in March. And then there's a recognition event um, in April where um, there will be a presentation made by Hennepin Tech, and then you'll receive your... Um, level of recognition. And then in AQIP, we also submitted the portfolio in November. You'll also be receiving a report in March. 
And then your strategy form, however, that's not until 2015-16, and then your comprehensive visit is 16-17. So what's going to be really fantastic is you're going to have both of these feedback reports and one site visit, and you're going to have made all of these improvements before you even have your comprehensive visit from HLC, and I think they're going to be very impressed. <laughs> So just a little bit about the process. Um, so you write an application. You submit that to Penn. Then what happens is they put a team together, usually six to seven people. And what they will be looking for is because you're a higher ed institution, uh, we are going to be looking at um, probably about half the team being from education. And uh, there's two team leads for each team, and one of those team leads is definitely from higher education. And, um, and so we make sure, though, that we have other sectors involved, involved as well. That's a little bit different from AQIP reviewers, um, because in Baldridge, we really want to get that broad perspective. Then what happens is each of those evaluators, they take your application, they read it individually, they start to look at the criteria, and then they make their own assessment of where they think that you're at. They look at each of those categories, and they actually come up with a sample score and where they think you're at on that level of maturity, and they start to pull out what they believe are the key strengths and the key OFAs. Then they come together for a consensus, which they're actually doing next week, and then they're going to look at all of that together, and then they're going to see where they're aligned, and they're going to start to have some more conversation and um, start to prepare for their site visit so that they can come here and um, clarify and verify what they read in your application. Then they're going to come here for a three-day site visit. And so the team itself sets the agenda for this. They look at your organization chart. Um, they look at um, everything in the application, and they think about where they have questions. They will meet with all of the senior leaders, and then they meet with a cross-section across the institution. And so they will set that agenda. And so the way everyone gets to be involved, though, in case you're not part of one of those interviews, then we will have the welcome and the exit presentations, and those will be broadcast to both campuses. And then the other thing that happens is what we call walk-around questions. So you might be in the cafeteria, you might be in the hallway, and one of the evaluators may approach you and just, you know, say that they're with Penn and ask if they could take a few minutes of your time. And all the questions are things that anyone can easily answer, whether it's a walk-around or if you're in the interview. They're simply going to be very curious about what you do here, how you do that, and they might ask you something specifically like, um, you know, what was the last training that you went to? Or what do you get recognized here for? Or how do senior leaders communicate with you? You know, so it's going to be very high level, um, broad questions, plain English. We make it a point to not use the Baldridge lingo. So um, we want to make sure that everyone can be part of the conversation. And then after that, they come back for that two-hour improvement planning session, and then, um, and then there's a recognition event. Behind the process, behind the scenes, is what we call the panel of judges. So once the team is done with their work and they have their draft feedback report, they present it to our panel of judges who are experts, and um, they need to ensure that there's consistency across the process. So for example, we have six organizations going through the process this year. And so the panel of judges will really challenge the team and the team leaders um, to make sure that the criteria is being applied consistently. So if somebody reaches the second level of award, we want to make sure everyone is, is really in that same place. And there's four levels of award, commitment, advancement, achievement, and excellence. And in Minnesota, our program is really about developing. It's not really just recognizing the best. At the national level, you'll only get a site visit if you're really at that top tier. Um, so that's why the state awards um, are very helpful, because you get recognized where you're at. So a little bit more about the site visit. It's three days. It includes both campuses. 
um, the agenda set by the team. Everyone gets to participate. I really encourage you to um, sit in on the, the welcome and the exit presentations. Um, the purpose for the evaluators, again, is just to really clarify and verify information based on what they learned in the application. They're going to have a very, very tight schedule. They usually have just minutes to get from one interview to the next. So um, they may say things to you like, um, don't be offended if we cut you off. Once we um, get the information we need, we're going to move on. So just know that. And then they're a little bit different from reviewers because because this is a scored process, um, we try to be as objective as possible, meaning that we don't accept gifts as evaluators. I've had to turn down very wonderful items um, because of this rule. However, um, you know, we don't exchange business cards. We're here representing ourselves as evaluators, not as the organizations that we represent. And so typically they'll just give you their first name and identify themselves as an evaluator. And then the things that they're listening for when you're talking about your processes with them, they want to know just what are the approaches that you're using to do your work? How well are they deployed? They're going to be listening for that. Um, they want to know, are you improving those processes? And then how well do those processes talk to one another? You know, you know how integrated are they? And then on the results side, they're looking at, you know, what are, what are the level of your results? Uh, what type of trends do you have? And then they also want to see who are you comparing yourself to? And would that be considered relevant comparisons? Because they may have some um, feedback for you on that as well. So again, no gotchas. They're, they're just going to be very curious um, to talk with you. And then... Um, just to conclude, I wanted to invite Donna up to talk a little bit more about results because this is really one of the key differentiators between um, Baldridge and AQIP and some of the other things that you're doing. There's just a much larger focus. So I will ask Donna to come up and have a wonderful site visit. Okay, so results. For Baldridge, all of the results were contained in Category 7. For AQIP, at the end of each process, we had to have a result. For each process, we had to have an improvement. And so what was similar and what really helped is we were pulling all these things together. And again, um, it's not just me. Um, it's you folks who generate the data by allowing us to take and offer surveys in your um, classrooms or that you provide surveys to your graduates or that you participate in other kinds of analysis kinds of things and without the data then I've got no results and so uh, again I have to say uh, my ear almost became a little bit uh, bloodied from on the phone all the time with Danielle up here and I and then I'd hang up from Danielle and then Nancy would be on the phone um, but I survived both AQIP and Baldridge and the results are the opportunity and it was a requirement by both organizations that we have internal and external comparisons and so for our, our internal comparisons we utilize the MinSKU performance metrics that I'm going to talk about later and for our external comparisons then we utilize some of the sequin institutions because they're two-year schools and they're also about quality improvement and then we looked at some of the private institutions that we have so those were our comparison groups once we gather all this stuff, it's kind of like, well, okay, we're not just going to have it sit there and be, you know, ignored. So I've now included it in the fact book, and that's the only thing that now is not updated on my IR webpage. I spent all day yesterday um, listing 72 new things. And so you will find the Baldrige application under the page that says continuous improvement. That's also where you'll find the organizational chart. You'll find the new AQIP portfolio on the section that says accreditation, regional accreditation. That's the 2014 or, um, AQIP portfolio application. And um, the results count for 50% of the points. We had better than about 200 charts and graphs that we needed to pare down. Because while I tried to get half of the pages from Nancy for this document, um, that didn't work because the other six processes also have to be recognized. And so um, we are presenting both averages, and now when they come for the visit, we will have the individual institutions and their results 
presented for the team when they come. But the results are critical, and I couldn't do the results without you. Two years ago, I introduced at the Wind Day the um, performance metrics that the Minsky was developing. And uh, we utilized some of those, as I said, for the measurements that we offered in both AQIP and our Baldridge applications. So again, because of the alignment that we're always trying to enforce of why are we doing something and where do they all fit in the scheme of things, uh, this chart illustrates for the, the first ones, and I've only selected about 12 out of the 26 because I have limited amount of time. So uh, the first uh, strategic direction was uh, ensure extraordinary access and extraordinary education for all Minnesotans. That aligns with our innovative programs with the Baldridge leadership piece, with AQIP helping students learn, with our Vision 2020 about developing measures, and with the biennium of advancing the competitiveness of the Minnesota workforce. The alignment is with student retention and completion, and that focuses in Baldridge on customer service, with AQIP on helping students learn, and again in the 2020 enhanced student retention and success, as well as accelerating completion. So one of the first measurements is the quality of our grads that we will provide an extraordinary education. And the first measurement that we will look at is the licensure pass rate. This is the percentage of those people who took an exam and they only consider four areas for the examinations. We have two, law enforcement and nursing. That's the percentage of the success rate of those people and the number that took it versus the success that completed it. So you can see across the years we've had an increase in the number of students taking state exams and our licensure pass rate is above the goal that was set for us by Minsky. The second one when we're looking at it is student persistence and completion and we've heard a lot about that. We have one of our um, outcomes that we're always looking for. One of our key results is percentage of completion and, and persistence. And this, however, is measured only on full-time, first-time students, whether they're new entering or whether they're transfer, but that's the measurement. And so again, if you look at the number of students coming into this cohort, you can see that it reflects as our enrollment has declined, so has the number of new students entering has declined. But you'll also see that this gradual, this was a gradual increase that we were asking to achieve in our student persistence and we've knocked it out of the ballpark. This is measured by their second fall that they come. So they're completing in 150 percent while they're, while they're coming through. The next context of the measure is just a basic completion rate. So that's the percentage of entering students in that cohort of the full time and how many complete and come through, and again, the context for this is the number of students that are entering in that fall cohort. We had 871 that came in in 11. Now, this is 811 data because you know they have to get through through 2013. We don't have all of those data. They're updated twice, these performance metrics, usually in late November, early December, and again in late April, early May. So we've, we've highlighted some of these. And again, you'll see it was a gradual implementation for the increase. Nobody had to automatically jump 12 points in order to get their goal. We've, we've declined a little bit on our completion rate. I think a lot of that is reflective of the fact that we have more part-time students coming in, and this is a full-time measurement. Affordability is the other measure, and that's, um, you know, how can we afford it, and how can we make sure that our students can afford it. And so we're looking at our tuition and fee now largely because the legislature's action, our increases in our uh, fees and tuition have not been as great as they had been previously. And so when you look at our trajectory, while we were only supposed to go with $155, uh, we've gone like $11 because they froze the tuition and gave you a very paltry amount of fees that you could increase. Diversity. We'll first look at our employee diversity, and so that's the measure of the number of employees of color as a percent of our total employees. And again, our number of employees of color, 65, has shown a gradual increase coming through, 
And that percent, again, we had a gradual increase that we needed to make coming around. And so again, we've achieved our goal. Just because you achieve it doesn't mean now you can slack off. You still need to keep working at it. This is all about continuous improvement. Our next measure was our student diversity. And we've made a lot of efforts and a lot of initiatives within the institution to improve our student diversity. This, again, is the measure of our, of our students of color that are credit only as a percent of our total credit enrollment. And so you can see that we had, again, a slight decline in our enrollment of students of color because our whole enrollment declined. But we've increased that percentage and we met our goal, which is always a good deal. Anytime you can say, we met it. So when Baldridge comes in and says, how do you know? We know, because we have the numbers. The next one is persistence and completion, and this is about fall enrollment. Persistence and completion is if you graduated, if you were stayed, or if you transferred off to another institution. So it's all three of those measures. And when we're looking particularly of our students of color, how did we do in comparison with our students of color and our percentage of white students? Now, if you look, the top column is our uh, percentage of our students of color at 74.3, and our persistence and completion rate for our non-students of color is 76. As was indicated earlier, we have the smallest gap in the state. Congratulations to us. <laughs> now I'll say to you, is 76% where we want to be? But this graphically illustrates it, and again, you can see that we are ahead after we had a little slight decline, but we rebounded. So we took the initiative, and now we need to keep it up there. The next one is our completion rate for just the students of color. And again, by the completion rate, we're taking the number of students of color that completed divided by the completion rate for the white students um, to give that ratio. And again, you can see how we had 34.3 for our um, completion rate for students of color in 2011. And that was based on a cohort of 239 students, a decline from the 260 the year before. So we dropped a little bit with this last measurement, where we were even to what we needed to meet at the 0.94%, and you'd like that gap to be right there at one. Um, so we need to do a little better on that, getting them through. Again, I think a lot of this is because we have part-time students, and it takes them longer than two years to get through. Um, diversity within our students. This is measured based on the SESI results. And uh, there are specific questions within SESI that the system looks at that says, how are we doing with our description and our cultural diversity on our campus? You'll notice that we had a huge decline in the number of responses that we got from students with this last administration in 14. But we still met our goal, that people still feel that this is a welcoming environment and that we have some diversity. But again, this is about improvement, and we can always get better. The second area I chose to focus on was the strategic framework that talked about being the partner of choice because partnerships are critical for us. Partnerships not only with our industry partners, but partnerships with our funding partners. And so that alignment occurs with our 2020 vision of developing partners that enhance public relations and increase our external support and with the under-equip un category of understanding students and other stakeholders' needs. We want to be the partner of choice to meet the community and workforce needs. That's at the heart of what we do. We train students to go out into the workforce and the communities. And so one of the big measurements for that is certificates and degrees awarded. And so you'll see that we are above where we should be or where the system thought we would be to meet our goal. But we did decline a little bit in the completion ratio at the last measurement in 2014. The next measurement is our related employment of graduates. And that one just simply looks at the percent of the institution grads in that physical year that were employed and then respond to the graduate follow-up survey. If they don't respond to that survey, 
then we can't count. And that's why, again, the persistence of calling these students, encouraging them to participate when they're graduating and you're having your follow-up with your alumni programs, encourage them, hey, when you get our alumni survey, please respond to it. Because this is a measurement that we need to have. And particularly because we say we train people for jobs. So we need to know, are you getting a job? We declined a little bit from the previous, but we're still about even with our goal that the system set for us. Now, again, this was capped because we didn't think it was fair that somebody say, well, you have to have a 100% employment rate when the state doesn't have a 100% employment rate. So it was capped at 94.3% based on the then unemployment rate for the, for the state at the time, and I, that's going to carry through through 2016. And then we'll probably reevaluate these metrics again. We take small steps over the five years to achieve these goals. And um, one again, the things is that we're looking at the baseline period of 153 students that we needed to increase. And our customized training and continuing ed program has led the metro area, but has led the state for years. And even though we had a little decline, we're still well ahead of the goal that the system set for us. But again, that doesn't mean that we can't do better. We recognize, too, that a lot of businesses don't have the money that they had previously that they can spend on training. And so they, like us, are doing a lot of things internally and on the cheap. Lastly, I want to say to you that if you measure what you value, people will value what you measure. So this isn't something original that I hatched in the middle of the night because I'm, you know, wildly crazy about data. This is something that a friend of mine uh, pointed out to me from the Harvard publication. But it's very true. And as the visiting team comes for the Baldridge site visit, a couple of things I also need to let you know is that I'm the chair for that site visit, so if you have questions about whatever, you can contact me. And the second thing is the biggest difference between this visit and an AQIP visit is they will not talk to students. This is about employees of the organization. This is about how we do our business and how we serve those students, but they will not talk to students as they're coming through. We don't have that finalized scheduled yet, but when we do, we'll let you know. And um, we can do this. We can meet these performance measures that the, that the system has set for us, that the institutions are all evaluated on. If you're interested in the rest of the 26 and the final definitions of all of the parts and how we got to these, these are located on my continuous improvement web page within the IR uh, list of pages. And I thank you very much. I'm not going to drink it. I, I, I <laughs> Just want to welcome everybody back for the start of the spring semester. Um, give you a quick update here, the, the budget of the college. Um, how do you work this thing? Oh, I just should. Um, last year, we built the, the 15 year fiscal year, or fiscal year 15 budget on enrollments of 4,100. As you can see here for 14, we had 42.14 as enrollments. Um, just for people who don't know what a FYE is, it's a full year equivalent. It's taken an amount of credits that students are taking and then dividing it by 30. 30. So uh, in the fall, in the end of October, we, we took a look at the fall enrollments. And, and you look at these prior years. And there's always a correlation between the 2,000, you know, you can see the 2,000 and there's pretty much whatever the enrollments were in the fall were what spring was uh, coming in at. Uh, so we revised it in October from 4,100 down to 3,950. Uh, right now, it's not looking quite as that correlation. You can see here in fiscal year 15 here, the second column from the right, where we're at only 1682 compared to the fall of 1829. Uh, the 3811, these numbers were uh, as of uh, Wednesday enrollments. Uh, just yesterday we added nine more FYE. 
Uh, the cold weather, we think, is also discouraging students from registering. So we're, we're anticipating a, a busy week next week for additional stu you know, students registering for credits. So you can see where we're starting to trend down towards between the 08 and the 09 enrollments. The fiscal year 08 was at 3781. So you can see the 3876 in the far left column there. That's in, we're bringing it down to 38.50. So, and I'll, I'll show you that in a couple more slides here. This is just a, a, a chart just showing the same information but more in a, a visual format where the black is the summer enrollments, the blue is the fall enrollments, and then the green is the spring. So, Here's a, a chart that I presented back in October showing the Metro two-year schools, their enrollments and their decreases from fiscal year 14 to fiscal year 15. And you can see HTC is at 6.4% decrease. But there are other ones like Anoka Ramsey down here at 10.4. Now you can see where the rest of the two-year colleges were and these these numbers are from a week ago Friday. Uh, we will be getting updated numbers uh, coming up here today, but I can't present that today. <laughs> um, but you can see it's not just HTC alone. There's a lot of other sister institutions that enrollments, uh, the economy's getting better, you know, so, so employment, and so that's what I think the whole system is feeling that. The impact on that re reduction of the from 39.50 FYE in in the fall and now down to 38.50 is 470,000 on the tuition reduction in revenues, and then uh, 27,000 in the tech fees for a total of 497,000 in the um, revenue stream. So I don't know how well everybody can see this in the back, but the uh, Far left-hand column, oops, far left-hand column is the revised budget, or was the budget back in the f fall when we revised it down to 39.50, and at the very bottom there we still had a budget shortfall of $80,000. This is in thousands of dollars, and you can see the impact is backing out the revenue reduction of the 470,000 and the. $470,000 in tuition and $27,000 in tech fee. To get us a revised budget in the far right-hand column, uh, where we're showing $577,000 uh, deficit at this time. When we put it into the system, and these are numbers as of um, December 31st, we we're showing that we still got uh, in the in the orange, the blue column is the actual revenue and, and expenses paid through, collected, and then it, it paid through December 31st. And the middle column, the green column, represents the billed revenues as of December 31st, and then assigned personnel and encumbered. So like we're still going to get some more billings here, more the students registering from December 31st forward. So. Uh, and then the, it's also the assigned personnel that we have in the system and encumbered non-personnel expenses. The orange column is, represents the, uh, the remaining budget to be collected or spent. Uh, we're going to be monitoring like these revenues on the top line at 4 million 13, and then also these expenses down here because we know we're going to be spending some of the non-personnel expenses. So we'll be monitoring that and analyzing the data you know, the next couple months. Um, now we move into, for, we're in a new, uh, legislators just went back to work here on Tuesday, um, and now they're already talking about trying to get both the, and this is an operating biennium cycle, so what that means is they'll be, uh, re, Minsky will be requesting for the next two years, 15 and 16 fiscal years, uh, that Minsky was requesting 142 million. And this is based on a freezing tuition and a 3% increase in salaries and fringe and a 3% increase in inflation in, in the operating cost. Um, what does this mean to HTC? Uh, 
It's $2.9 million for salary and fringe and 828000 for the inflation and operating costs. And then I just heard this morning that President Obama is uh, public funding for community college students, for all students. So we'll see how that, you know, if anything comes out of that type of, uh, for the technical colleges, all two-year colleges. So it's one of those years we just got to stay tuned and I'll, I'll give you information as we, we receive it. Uh, questions? I plan on having a budget open form here in February sometime to, you know, you know uh, inform you what the information we have at the time. I know it, the, the way these operating cycles go, it can change. Like I know two years ago, it did change at the last minute. So, uh, and I don't want to keep your head spinning either, because if I give you every, you know, we do a lot of what if scenarios a lot of times, but it does, it will get confusing if I give you every what if scenario. Now I'll turn it over to Marilyn for updates on academic and student affairs. Thank you. Well, I know that's ve that's very sobering. Um, very sobering news. Uh, we are really concerned, of course, about our enrollment. Um, I was thinking as we've gone through the morning with our continuous quality improvement and the focus that we have at Hennepin Tech is that we are looking at retention more than ever. Not that we didn't look at it before, but now more than ever. With a very low unemployment rate, we are finding industry is trying to kind of snatch students away and get them on a good paying job before they have graduated and you know make the promise well we'll let them finish but that doesn't always occur so we're in a very interesting kind of situation now where we need to really look at what is best for the student and student success I want to share with you a, a short email that um, I was was uh, given and it really focuses on the student success this was an interchange with a faculty and a student who was trying to get his his or her first job and you know needed some help with the resume and the interchange was after the semester had ended. So we're talking about December 29th, and this faculty is still working with this student. And the student did get their very first job through the support of the faculty in that area. And this was the response that the instructor gave to the student. I believe you will really like working with these guys. You probably already know this, but here is some key advice. Be humble, have a positive attitude, Work hard, always smile, find and do what needs to be done, and never, never be late for work. Learning what they have to teach you is experience that can be as important as your education. Isn't that what we're all about, that it is that continuous developing of students, our graduates, and their success? Well, I will have Dara share some of our initiatives at Hennepin Tech at looking at student success. We, as a whole academic and student affairs division of the college, are looking at every way that we can reduce barriers to students. And so we'll hear from both Dara and from Nathan. We're looking at more responsive scheduling. We're looking at at recognizing when students do need intervention or intrusive advising. We're looking at more e-forms so that students don't have to be cons you know, so confused about where do I get this form, how do I do this, so that we do have our processes that are more aligned. Thank you, Nancy, for encouraging us to do that, um, and so that we do create a much more positive experience for students. So I will turn it over to Dara. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, what a great segue, her story about the faculty and the student. Um, it's all about the students, and so each one of you could come up here today and you could share a story around student success, right? What that means for the student while they spend time here on campus and how we prepare them for the life beyond HTC. And so um, this morning has been really focused on our quality improvement uh, that continuous improvement that we're dedicated to and our performance excellence. And at the heart of all of that is our students, right? Um, so I want to just take a few moments to share some campus-wide initiatives that we've been working on so that we can update you on the progress of those. Uh, supplemental instruction, we've talked a little bit about that since last spring uh, and again earlier this fall. 
Remember, supplemental instruction takes a look at supporting an entire class versus an individual student. It looks at supporting them in the classroom and ideally immediately outside of the classroom in order to reinforce concepts from that course. Um, we've had some successes and some challenges this fall, but we're moving forward for spring and beyond. Um, some of the successes is just really building that foundation on campus. Um, I've been able to work with a great team, Jean Kreuter, Julie Nelson, and Lisa Blower South, um, to uh, start with this foundation and get the structure really going for the program. Um, we have had informational meetings. We had a large campus-wide meeting that people attended, and we've also done several uh, program, small group, and individual uh, meetings to get some feedback about what SI might look like for your class or your program area and how we might be able to support you. Um, and then uh, we've seen faculty interest as well as staff interest, and so I thank you all for that. Um, um, at really looking at ways that we can add this as another tool in our toolbox to support students academically. Um, the CSA collaboration, our Centers for Student Achievement, is really important because they have peer tutors, and um, we're looking for, for peer tutors for SI, and it's really about being able to offer both experiences, and so we're working in alignment with the CSA, and Jean and Julie and Lisa bring that expertise and that connection with our professional tutors. Um, and then we've also been in communication quite a bit with uh, Adult Basic Ed and some other potential outside partnerships. Some challenges we've faced is just finding peer tutors. Uh, our students are very busy, as you know, um, and they take on a lot uh, in their day. Um, uh, availability to be able to find folks that have completed a course that we want to support with SI and then have them be able to come and, and help come back and tutor for us. Um, and compensation. As our economy gets a little bit better, uh, students are able to get more hours at their outside jobs and, and maybe uh, better pay. And so just trying to find a way to stay competitive and have them realize the importance of being able to maybe boost their resume with this experience. And then also we've talked a lot in every meeting that I've had with faculty and staff, we've talked about what all of you know and you see every day is that our students need that academic support, but there's also all of these other barriers that they encounter that prohibits them from getting to that class or staying after class for SI, um, which could be any host of things that's going on in their life from transportation and child care and, and all of those things. And so we're really looking at, um, of course, there's ways we're already addressing that on campus, but looking for additional um, ways to, to connect um, with students in that way to support them. Um, all right, spring initiatives. So uh, we are entering, we work very closely with the math department, um, and, and they've had great interest in finding any ways that we could provide additional support with the, re with the redesign this summer. And so I've been working closely with Jenny Joa and Andrea Butner, and um, we have been in communication with our ABE partners that we already collaborate with to see if there's some way that we could uh, have them provide some additional support. They've expressed interest. Uh, a whole team of us, uh, in fact, the largest team that was in attendance uh, just before break, we were over at North Hennepin for the uh, Adult Pathways Summit for, for Minskew, and uh, we had a great team of faculty, staff, and administration there, and um, all of our ABE partners were in attendance. And so we were able to have those face-to-face -face conversations to say, well, what might a next step look like? And so our Excuse me, our faculty is currently working with the AB instructors and we're going to be able to support uh, two of our developmental math sections with ABE instructors. So we're going to give that a try and just see how it goes. Thanks. Thank you to everybody who's working on that. We're going to see how it goes. It's a, it's a learning experience for us and it's a pilot and, um, and we'll take uh, what we can from it to uh, continue to grow that collaboration. We're also looking at two additional sections of math to be uh, supported with peer tutors. And then um, we have many other areas that have come forward, both in gen ed and program areas, and our team is working to find tutors to try to uh, continually add to the, the areas that we're able to support. Lisa Blowersouth has talked to folks at Hamlin University. She had a connection there with uh, education program majors, and um, some of the work that they need to do in the field is they're progressing through their studies and that there might be a partnership there too. So if you're interested um, in, in getting involved and haven't already expressed that, I would love to hear that because uh, we'll be continuing to move forward in plans for fall semester. The next is our HTC Achieve program. Uh, HTC, um, as you already heard, uh, has been the recipient of the Otto Bremer Foundation Finish Line Scholarship Grant in the amount of $100,000. 
Um, we were one of 10 Minsky institutions that received funds from Otto Bremer, and really they're looking at trying to provide some additional financial assistance to increase semester to semester persistence of students and completion rates. And so we will utilize that $100,000 in the form of uh, tuition assistance. It's basically a, a gap scholarship, so up to $1,000 in tuition to offset financial aid. Excuse me, and also um, up to $600 in books and supplies to support them. We're looking at first time, full time students um, uh, as the iPad definition for first time, full time. Um, and these students, of course, will have uh, wraparound services because we can't, we know that by just handing out money, yes, that helps one of the barriers, but that um, we need to provide that continual support. So we're looking at a cohort of 50 students for spring semester. 25 at Brooklyn Park and 25 at Eden Prairie, and they'll have additional requirements to be a part of the program. We're working in collaboration with the foundation to be a part of the, scholars, the, the regular scholarship process um, to be able to get students that are interested in this program. Um, so if you have questions about this, you'll be seeing more uh, probably by next week. You'll receive more information about this should there be students that maybe haven't been contacted that you want to send our way. Uh, Christine Ramos-Walker is going to be the primary contact. You can also certainly contact me. Uh, the other uh, great opportunity with Otto Bremer is that this is a new uh, opportunity through them, and so they're working with all 10 institutions to kind of glean some best practices from it. And if we're able to meet some benchmarks, um, then we'll be able to renew um, for the coming years. And then we would hope to ask for a $200,000 amount for next year because we'd be looking at the entire academic year to provide support. I also want to update you that we're busy writing. Um, it's uh, come time for one of our, our first uh, TRIO grant that we received at HTC, Student Support Services. They're uh, going to complete their five-year cycle this year. And so it's time to write for a continuation grant. It's due on February 2nd. We're also planning to submit a second proposal for an SSS uh, program that would support exclusively English language learner students. We have many English language learners that are part of our our. Uh, regular SSS program, but we definitely have the need in our student population to be able to expand those services to more students. So it would, uh, it would give us that opportunity and also help us to strengthen and leverage our current SSS program. Uh, grant uh, amounts are st staying stagnant and, of course, all of our costs increase, and so we're looking for ways that we can uh, leverage those resources to better serve students. And then each subsequent year, we'll be submitting grants for the rest of our TRIO and GEAR UP programs. So we'll be looking at educational talent search, Upward Bound, and then GEAR UP um, as we go forward in the next few years. Last but certainly not least is uh, Student Success Day. There's flyers out at the tables as you go out. You also, there was an email sent just before the end of the semester, but I'll send a reminder um, once we get into the start of the semester here. Uh, that outlines what's going on for this year. I just wanted to quickly highlight a couple of things um, that are new for this year. We decided to put some time in in the morning to dedicate to some professional networking, professional involvement activities. And so we're hoping you might have some ideas for us. We're working with Annette and we'll be working with uh, Mike McGee and the deans to identify um, some contacts. But what we envision, um, and we're pretty open, is an opportunity for students to come in. They'll have some guided time, um, some questions and things that they could go around and ask uh, some guests that we could have on campus that would be uh, professional associations that are uh, part of career and technical programs um, so that students can see the importance of getting connected with them early on, and many of our students already are, right? Um, and then also some of our general professional associations, whether it be Toastmasters or Rotary or something like that, so that they really get some practice and some connections early on with those professionals. So we're going to give that a try. And then the second piece is uh, many of you, as you've been submitting proposals for the last two years, they've centered around things that you could do within your program. And we want to continue to encourage that. So we set aside workshop session number one. If you, this is completely optional, but if you have an interest in providing something for your program students that you can't usually provide within the class, that maybe you want to bring in a speaker or a panel or do something, we wanted to set aside a time that you could do that. And uh, for those students or programs that aren't offering something, we'll certainly have other program offerings for them to attend during that time. But we thought we'd throw that out and see how that goes. Um, and then also, 
But the evening session, we're going to continue to offer an evening session, but we have a much lower turnout for our evening, um, and especially at Eden Prairie. And so we wanted to still provide an option, but also maximize our resources of staffing. And so we're going to try to do it just at Brooklyn Park this year and see how things go with numbers. So we need you um, to submit those proposals for programs. Again, I will send out another reminder um, with the, the link for the online proposal form. We would love for you to promote, promote, promote um, so that students know the importance of attending that day. If you can somehow incorporate it into your class, your syllabus, that would be much appreciated. Um, and, uh, and we're always looking for volunteers on the day to help out in any way um, that we may need. So thank you very much. Uh, before we do that, I'm going to uh, ask Nathan to come forward. He has some updates. And, you know, I just want to say um, for one moment, Nathan is, you know, I've called him my work buddy because we started here the same day, right, September of 2012. And so this is my last workshop with Nathan before he moves on uh, from HTC. And so I just wanted to thank him for being my work buddy and for the work he's done for HTC these last two years. Thank you. Thanks, Dara. I, that could have been a lot worse. I was waiting for the joke. Or, I was like, oh, dear. Thank you. I owe you one. So I want to talk about enrollment efforts and enrollment services and the advisors for just a couple minutes. We gave you a rather detailed update in the fall semester, and I'm coming back to close a couple of loose ends from that. Um, but first, I want to talk about other things in enrollment services. I uh, want to acknowledge the effort of several different groups who have made some big progress for us. Um, in terms of enrollment efforts, we've got more calling and emailing to our prospective students going on than ever before. And I wanted to acknowledge in particular Maggie Viscottrell, um, who has been in the call center making phone calls for us over the last several weeks. I would imagine it's pretty hard to say no to Maggie. So um, <laughs> I have found that to be the case. So that was one of the reasons we chose her. And she has diligently over the break been um, contacting our prospective students. And the nice part that she was relating to me is she gets them on the phone and they immediately can have a problem-solving discussion with her and figure out what the obstacles are, what the barriers. So we found that to be effective. And um, even though all the colleges are facing really difficult enrollment environment this semester, um, we've, we've been pleased with the work she's done and I wanted to acknowledge that. Um, for program enrollment planning, certain departments and programs have been engaging with enrollment services in a enrollment marketing planning event campaign. So we, we listen, we talk, we make a plan together about what our next steps are for reaching out to not, not marketing in general, but one-on-one -on -one marketing with the prospective students we know. And I wanted to acknowledge the work of Allison Lewis in that. And um, Allison, as you may know, is also departing the college, uh, actually the same day I am. So that work will have a temporary pause, but it's going to continue because it is definitely, um, I think, as some of the programs would attest, achieved some results, and it's an effective and excellent dialogue. So I wanted to acknowledge Allison's hard work on that, the work of many faculty who have partnered with her, and um, just to let, tell you that that will be continuing. Um, also, Ready, Set, Go Week, as you know, is going on this week. It has been particularly effective because we've had the courses we needed. 85% um, of the people who walk in the door for Ready, Set, Go Week have left registered this year. Um, at the fall semester, it was only about 60%. So that is a, it's a major, major improvement in terms of how a student, a brand new student new to the college, last minute, worried, anxiety ridden, all that. If they leave registered, we have left, they have left with such a better experience than if they left on a bunch of waiting lists. So I want to acknowledge the faculty and the deans for getting the courses that we needed on the schedule, keeping them on the schedule, and um, I think it's paying off. So we're very, very happy to see that. Uh, lastly, I, as I said, I wanted to close loop on a couple things about the advisors. Um, after much discussion and um, listening, we have recently changed their titles to enrollment advisors to, effect, to um, reflect the work that they do in student affairs and its role within the student life cycle. Because they don't just do admissions, like they used to be admissions advisors. They don't just do admissions. They might take care of a second year student's financial aid question, for instance, or um, help them with an appeal for something like random, like a, a, just a, a glitch they had or something. So we wanted to get that whole life cycle thing reflected in their title. And it's a title that's a little more common in the industry. 
So they are enrollment advisors now, and as promised, updated enrollment advisor assignments are on the Counseling and Advising website. You can find them. Um, we heard faculty's voices very strong that asked for consistency. So where possible, we've made very few changes. So you'll see those posted, and um, they're, they're being used now. So just go to our, our website and look for Counseling and Advising. And a, a little bit about the advisors that I didn't share with you last time. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about them as people. You know, you know, we have up at Brooklyn Park, we have Ricky Gonzalez, we have Anna, we have um, Mary, and we have the other one, um, Angel. Oh, my gosh. And then at Brooklyn Park, we have uh, Nia, and we have Phyllis, and we have Walid. So um, at those are our seven advisors. A couple things about them that they thought I should share. Um, six of the seven have bachelor's degrees. The other one is under unrelenting pressure from her peers to finish those last couple courses, and they told me I could say that. Um, two of them, you may not know, are HTC alums, Walid and Angel, and they both, and this is kind of nice, advise the programs that they graduated from. So that's a nice little um, tie-in. Uh, two of them have half earned or almost completed master's degrees, and two of them have the international equivalent of master's degrees. And um, the neat part is all of them are expected and trained to serve all the students that come their way. They're not, we don't bounce people around. We don't say, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, you're really going to have to see Mary. I'm just not your advisor. So we do help where we can. I wanted to share that. And then one thing that was asked of us today was that we tell you a little bit about what the advisors are hearing from the students. So Mary Babcock is going to come and in like three seconds summarize the messages that the students give us. So Mary, you want to come up? Mary's one of our advisors at Brooklyn Park, whose name I didn't forget. So, um, Mary. Good morning. I just wanted to give you a little bit of information about what the advisors at both campuses are hearing from students as far as what they want and what they need. Um, as far as courses and programs, students are really looking for programs and courses in the morning and in the evening. The afternoon courses for students, from what we're hearing, are just not popular. And that's because students are having to work around work schedules, first, second, third shift jobs. They also have to work around their children's school schedules when they get off the bus, when daycare is open, and so on. So that's a big request from our students is those morning and afternoon programs and or sorry, morning and evening programs and courses, not so much in the afternoon. And hopefully that will help you to hear that as faculty so you know really what our students are requesting from the advisors and what we're hearing frequently. Um, the other thing that we're hearing about is that um, students are frequently asking for Friday and Saturday courses. And that's because with our students working and they have families and they have other commitments, they're really looking at having those Friday and Saturday courses so they can work their lives around their school schedules because they do want to come and they do want to complete, but they are juggling a lot of balls and we have to make sure that they have things available for them that's convenient for their lives. We also wanted to thank the faculty for inviting the advisors to their program update meetings and also to their advisory meetings. Um, it's really helpful for us to sit in with all of you, hear your discussions, find information out about your programs, and also what you would like us to know so that we can make sure we give the best information to the students from your perspective also. We equally want to thank you for coming to our program update meetings where you have an opportunity to come and present to us so that we hear from you what you want us to know, but also you can hear from us the things that we're hearing about students and what their needs are. Um, as advisors, we want you to know that we're here to collaborate with you, we're here to work with you, we're here to team up with you and partner with you, <clears throat> excuse me, so we can make a good team effort, help our students succeed and be successful and graduate from Hennepin Technical College. Thank you. Mary has been um, sharing that information with the deans and with myself and all, really um, making sure the voice of the student is heard in these discussions, and I really appreciate that. One thing I forgot to mention in terms of developments is at Brooklyn Park, we've implemented walk-in testing in the testing center. Uh, walk-in testing means that you don't have to be there at 8.30, and heaven knows I'm a bad test taker at 8.30 in the morning, but you don't have to be there at 8.30 to take your test. You reserve a day, you come whenever, we fit you in. And the neat part is it's really increased our capacity for testers and it's helping us serve the students better. Uh, 
at um, Brooklyn Park, and I acknowledge Sue Schmitz and her team for the work they've done on putting that together. So just a few updates, a lot of changes. Um, I want to thank you all for two and a half years I've been able to work with you. It's been an honor and a privilege and a lot of fun. So best wishes. Thanks, everybody. Um, I've gotten a few questions about the presidential search, so I just wanted to um, take a minute to update you. Uh, we, we, we've done a couple of things this fall. Uh, we had the chancellor out at the, um, the fall workshop, and I think most of you were able to attend that. Um, on Octo October 2nd, um, we had put together a search advisory committee meeting, and we had our first meeting um, on October 2nd. And then on or around November 1st, um, the, the application process for, for the president at Hennepin Tech started. And um, it, it isn't that we haven't been doing anything since then. There's been a number of things behind the scenes. Um, you should all be able to see there's a presidential search um, tab off of the, our front page. And we've added quite a bit of information about Hennepin Tech because we do know that, that prospective applicants for that position will be going out looking at our website and um, looking at the information that we have. Um, we did, we expect they're going to look at the whole website, not just the presidential website. Um, but we did put, try to put some links um, that, that we think they'd be most interested in. And so for spring semester, um, things will kind of start to heat up, particularly for the search advisory committee. And I did want to let you know, um, on the presidential website, there is a listing of who is on the presidential search advisory committee. There have been a couple changes since October. Um, Merland Erickson had been the, the AFSCME representative on that committee. As many of you know, um, she moved to Anoka Ramsey Bemidji State um, for, a, for a position there. And so Maggie Viscacho, she gets around everywhere, um, is now going to be serving as the AFSCME rep. And just this week, um, we made a change to um, Sandy Lewandowski, who many of you know from 287. She had been uh, our kind of our high school K-12 rep on that committee. She won Superintendent of the Year. And um, we're all very happy for her. Unfortunately, the award ceremony that take place in San Diego is um, it, it covers the, the second or the third search advisory committee meeting and the two days of the airport interviews. So luckily, we have another person that many of you know, Rose Hobson, agreed to stand in. And really, this is hot off the press. If you go to the presidential website, it still has Sandy's name on it. But we'll make those changes. But we're really thrilled with the, the quality and caliber of the people that are on that committee. And so so I just wanted to show you kind of what we've got left for the for um, spring semester, and just a just a little reminder about it um, because it gets a little tough the the further into the process that we go, especially when they come on campus, and that's simply that the president um, is not an employee of Hennepin Tech. So when I say search advisory committee, that is really what that group is doing. They'll be coming up with, with um, sort of semi-finalist finalist to, to um, refer back to the system office. And that's where that final decision is made with, with the Board of Trustees. So if you have any questions about how it's progressing, please feel free to give me a call. and. Um, um, I think the most important thing is when the folks come out for the forums, which is at the end of March, early April, please, please, please participate in those open forums. Thank you. Bring up some props. Um, 
since not everybody is um, able to participate on the days, just as a quick reminder, um, we're videotaping um, this whole session and then the PowerPoint slide deck um, will be available and distributed. We'll let you know um, how to access those so that anybody that's not here, you want to kind of remind them, hey, you can access um, and, and see what went, went on the whole day. Or if you want to refer back to any particular item that happens to, um, um, hey, that seems really important. I want to go back to that. So we'll um, provide access to both of those from a technology perspective. Um, re um, referring back to the fact that not everybody is here, um, a number of my team too is supporting a, a large um, contingent of students that are meeting down at Eden Prairie Campus. So quick shout out to those staff members of my team that aren't here. Um, and again, I always try to acknowledge at all these events. Um, it does take a little bit to set up the technology and things. So you know, Jason, thanks you for your um, service um, setting this um, event up today and support by team members um, that are um, in addition to that because we're taking a team approach to many of the media services um, now that we have a couple of changes. And speaking of those changes, you know, media services is really at one of the forefront. We lost, um, unfortunately, um, through retirement, so we, it's not really a loss, but we're excited. Um, Doug Mason has gone on to that uh, elusive retirement piece that we all seek at some point in our life. Um, um, just a, an outstanding employee. Um, however, um, with departures come new opportunities, and so our media services group is pulling together cohesively as a team, and I thought I'd highlight a couple of those changes that we're going to try. And, uh, and seek feedback from you um, and see how things work out. So um, with Doug leaving, um, Jason has um, relocated back to the Brooklyn Park campus. Um, Colleen will also be located in that service area. Down at the Eden Prairie campus, we're going to have Joe Mai um, office out of the um, um, G115 Media Services area, and one of our new staff members I'll mention um, coming up here will also be joining him in there. So again, from a team perspective, we have media services. Remember, we used to have individual people doing that. But we're going to broaden that and try to do an um, interaction between our, our IT team and uh, media services so that we can ensure that the services needed by faculty, staff, and administration are continued. So um, some things that, in addition to that, um, with departures, uh, you really need to take a, a new approach and say, well, what are the services most needed by the college? And so we're in the, embarking at the moment at looking at a new position. With Doug leaving, um, what is the best um, approach for that particular headcount? How can we best serve um, students, as we've been talking about quite a bit today, through the good services that faculty, staff, and administration are providing? So um, at the moment, the Technology Committee is assisting me in um, developing that um, position description. So if you um, have ideas and um, real passionate things that, you know, we really make, sh make sure that these types of services are continued, I want to make sure that you have that linkage and voice also. So please talk to one of the um, technology committee members. Um, if you're kind of not familiar with everybody that happens to be on here, I know the, um, just just a, a quick glimpse. Again, you'll have the slide deck. Um, the technology committee minutes are on the um, desire um, to learn site. So that's one of the committee areas where you can look at all our minutes and that. But please reach out to one of the individuals on our group and provide your insights. Because again, I think this um, services that IT provides and media provides um, do have value. And we want to make sure that we're providing the right value at the right time. So speaking of changes just a little bit, um, some of the things we're going to try out is um, their technologies have changed also over time. And so um, one of the services that has waned a little bit um, has been um, needs for such things as the wide format printing or photography, for example. You might say, well, you know, photography, that makes sense. Um, how many people have cell phones? How many people take selfies? Let's do a little hand, hand raising here. And so, you know, this type of technology actually has really good resolution and it's a good piece of technology, but, you know, it doesn't replace the professionalism sometimes that's necessary. And that's where we have, you know, excellent um, services through our marketing department and we have other professionals that come in and help us. Um, those services are still available, but you might want to engage those. So. Um, marketing might be a consulting group. IT will be a consulting group to say, when is it best to engage one of those outside professionals? Um, printing might be another um, case of that, the wide format printing. For example, um, a lot of services have grown up um, around our industry. You think of the Kinkos and other services. They're right down the street. They do an ex exceptional professional job. That's their specialty and um, you know, engage those. So we're going to try to experiment with how do we right, bring the right service to the right need at the right price and the right timing. Um, but that doesn't mean we're leaving people um, to fend for themselves. And I just want to make sure that everybody understands that um, our media staff that are with us, our IT staff, are here to commit 
to work with you on that transition. So ask one of us, see, you know, hey, I, I want to try to do something new. I want to take my own um, pictures for something internal that may not need that high level um, quality. Now, we kind of teased a little bit about the, the cell phones for an um, example, but one of the things you could do um, if you um, want to take pictures, <clears throat> if everybody's seen, you know, the cameras that have been out for quite a while, um, you know, you just take a, um, a, a snapshot. Internally, a lot of times they have, you know, these little flash drives that are in here. You know, the, the pictures are saved digitally, put them in a computer, and those can be shared and used in a lot of publications. So the technology has changed. It's enabled um, people to be able to do new things in new ways. And um, as a learning organization, here's a chance that we're going to embrace some new technology, new ways with um, support from my department to be able to um, try out those new procedures. The basic thing is, again, give us feedback. If it's working, great. We'll continue. If we need refinements, great. Let's get the feedback and make the re refinements. One of the um, things I'd like to um, highlight, though, is if you want us to do a particular service, um, since we have kind of the, the staffing combinations that we have, um, you know, service um, lead time always is appreciated. Um, and then how would you access that service? Um, similar to the IT, you know, we have the um, IT work request on the faculty and staff web page. You know, you click that little link, you log in with your star ID, and then you submit that. Um, you can also call the, um, if there's, you know, some type of emergency need, you know, the IT helpline 1411 is still available. So here's some other changes as far as personnel in the more IT area that's coming up. Um, recognizing, I think, in the past, um, from the summer on, people have known that we've had um, three um, poignant position changes. And um, I'm pleased to announce today that we do have our first hire um, coming up for one of our ITS replacements. Um, there probably will never be a true replacement for, um, as Cecilia's often said, our beloved Chad that's worked on in Eden Prairie. But we have to recognize that we do have really excellent other individuals that can step up and do good work. And I have a number of them in my staff, and I'm appreciative of that. But bringing in new, new people and new perspectives and new talents is part of what we do to continue our um, quality journey. And so I'd like to um, highlight that um, Don Gumbiner will be joining our staff. He's been a CLA in the um, CCIS division of the college for a number of years. And Don's worked um, off his seasonal um, employment when he isn't working in that area. He's helped out IT in a number of areas. So we've had a chance to participate in the quality work that Don's able to bring to the table. So um, Don will be starting next Wednesday, and he will be working down at um, Eden Prairie. And he will be um, located in that um, G. Um, 115 um, media service office area. So um, again, team effort. Um, please welcome Don in um, his new role for that particular position. But we do have a couple of other positions that will be coming up. Just kind of um, quickly tell you what's going on. Um, at Brooklyn Park here, we have um, an evening position and a day position. The um, search committee um, is um, being formed at the moment for the um, evening um, Brooklyn Park position. Um, that, that position, in addition to our um, normal case, uh, normal support that all our IT members provide, um, will also focus on ensuring that we have um, advancements in our um, case system tool. That's the one that does our help desk tool that I just talked about, you know, turning in a ticket. But it's so much more than that. That's the system that we use to inventory technology to be able to send out um, um, updates to our computers um, automatically so that we can work more efficiently and effectively also. So that's a real improvement. Um, the other one, um, as you see up on the board, is an ITS2 position in days. And that's more of a generalist, but again, um, a good service lead um, to be able to provide the services and um, quality um, initiatives that you need to be able to accomplish your work through technology. Now, one thing I'd like to highlight is with a great appreciation, um, administration and others um, thought deeply about what does IT need in order to be able to provide service for the college. And if you notice that all these three positions are twos, Chad was a two, and that um, position was refilled as a two. But the other two positions at Brooklyn Park have been elevated from ones to twos. So we're recognizing, particularly we had um, a recent IT assessment that says we need to make sure that we provide the right skill level with the right attitudes and aptitudes and the right values to be able to provide skills in, so in a fashion so that the people being served have the um, you know, capacity to, to provide you know, good quality outcomes. And so we've raised the, um, the value or the position level of those positions to ensure that you have the service level and the talent to be able to get the services that you need. So my great appreciation for that to be um, allowed. Thank you, Randy. 
Uh, good morning. And I'm going to talk about the website, which is our front door. And I want to thank all of you for helping to create an environment where we have such vibrant photos of technology. When we started the project, one of the things that I wanted to focus on is technology. We Not very many people have technical in their name, and let's show what we have here. So with the redesign, the idea of this came because of the fact that everything is going mobile. We were looking at the small screen. It needed to be responsive to what is going on. So it's important that the screen there show, shows what the information is without being cut off. If you know of an unresponsive screen when you pull up on your phone, you can't. You have to keep on swirling around. This will actually go to that the, the size that you need if it's a tablet or a phone. I want to um, also highlight on this screen, it's important that people don't have many clicks. So that's what we're also addressing. And also, I want you to notice the number of clicks um, per year. When people are on coming to view pages, they are. this is not internal, because we can know that. We actually know actually who is on the page. Um, we can do statistics on that through Google Analytics. Our marketing firm can tell you that information. We've discussed that at our marketing work group. And if you want that information, we can share that at any time. But again, we have lots of visitors on our website. Um, I want to look at the goals of this. I want to highlight um, visually showing technology and partnerships. You have all done a tremendous job on partnerships. Yesterday we had a meeting, and it was regarding um, certainly fundraising, but discussing the legislature, and it was discussing the leveraged equipment. And I have to say, every time Hennepin Technical College comes up because you blew the goal out of the water. You were the only two-year school. We were the only one. We were against two, four years at $500,000. This represents who you are. And it's because of you that I have the most, I have the best job in the world to say I work with people who know people that make a difference in communities, which speaks to what, what legislators want to talk about. They want to talk about industry. It's making this state viable, and we are producing the people that work. When you allow us to come into your classroom and do a video and photos, it is exciting. People constantly say, because we work with the vendors who do the pictures, who do the taping, what a great place. They love the fact that we have people that are accepting of that. We show we have great photos, and everybody loves using our photos to show what's going on. This, again, comes down to you, and you make the difference in the history of what goes on here. But again, this speaks to the legislature because it speaks of vibrancy that goes on here, and I love telling that message, as does Cecilia when we go out. Okay. Um, Olive and Company are the best vendors that we chose. This is what they provided. Um, I want to thank Artishir, but Sue, Sue who provides all the information on the courses. What you type in shows up, but that comes from the faculty. So I want to thank all of you for providing that information because that's what feeds, that's what people are looking at, and that's what they're knowing what they're going to be trained on. So thank you for all of you. I know it's a huge task. Um, also, the tagline, Ignite, it's ex again, it's the vibrancy of what goes on here. We can use it with multiple verbs. Um, it shows, again, what the excitement that you have and that you move people along. The timeline, um, this is how it has gone. Um, I want you to notice the ending listening session on marketing and web that you received an invitation yesterday. It will be through ITV on both campuses. Please, again, go in, give your feedback. We like to hear what's going on. Again, lots of people enter our website. They want to have information. Um, thanks to Megan, the people doing the phone calls, that follows up on those people that seek out HTC. Um, the phases that are coming, um, we did some beta sites. If you look at About and at the news page, you can see what the news site will look like. This is to ensure that when we roll out the site, we are not having lots of glitches. This allows people to test it out, bring up questions, and again, address what should be shown at HTC. Building the HTC community. I want you to know that feeding of the website isn't, uh, as you know, by the number of page views, how important it is for the information. Because of um, Artishir 
pro, um, doing the coding for each page, we have selected or people have stepped up as power um, users and I want you to seek those people out. That will help you get your information up to date. I want to thank all those people who have agreed to do that. It will make a huge difference and again keep us vibrant and current and again as we put new photos and videos up um, that will also make a difference. Now with the external sites that are listed they will not be of course responsive just so people know that uh, we have no control over those sites. Now this is what again a PC will look like and this is what a phone will like. It'll com compress down to that. Again if you have any questions please follow up. I know that we're over time right now but again I want to thank all of you again and we do a great job of reaching out and making a difference in communities and thank you very much. Oh, the meeting for is Tuesday afternoon. Um, it'll be at 1.30 until 3 and you received an information on that. So again, we'll follow up and we'll send out another invite. Oh. Okay, we're at the end, but we um, have a small but very dedicated group of um, fun committee members. And one of the things that we've been able to do this year is have a our own fantasy football league that was actually um, led by Jason Jones. Last year we had Marguerite Doomer um, who won it. Is she here? Yep. And this year, as you can see, um, Jeremy Clark won. Is he here? Come on down. And hold up the award. The award was was built by our own welding instructor, um, Chris. Maybe other people. He wants to blame other people or give credit. What? Okay. Well, so it's beautiful, right? It is, and um, it's been sitting in my office, and I might need one of these because I really don't want to give this away. <laughs> I take great pride in this. <laughs> You know, he you he really is a little bit bigger this. than I am, you know, so he might be able to get look, away with this. We really need to give it over, so go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. The top team, to you got to, oh. you know. The secret, was, the secret to success was picking Packer players. Go Pack. Oh. 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 Who is going to be the rookie of the year this year? Rookie of the year. Um, Quarterback for the Vikings. Who? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks again. Congratulations. And we're now at the end. Um, please remember the evaluation forms. It's very quick and easy for you to fill out. We do read them and take notice of, uh, of your feedback. Uh, faculty, don't forget there is a sign-in sheet. You'll want to make sure that you do that. And if there are any faculty that don't know where they're going this afternoon, please check in with your dean. <laughs>